Good evening and welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Northampton School Committee on uh, Thursday, November 9th, 2017. Before I officially call the meeting to order, uh, we do have one piece of important uh, housekeeping uh, prior to the meeting. Uh, as you know, we had a municipal election on Tuesday, November 7th. Um, and as part of that election, uh, there was uh, the filling of a seat that had been vacant uh, in Ward 6. Um, and our uh, interim colleague became our, our actual elected colleague. Uh, Lonnie Kaufman was elected as the representative in Ward 6. And the charter is very specific that once that uh, seat is filled, that they are to be sworn in immediately. So we, are, um, we have tonight the uh, newly elected and sworn in uh, city clerk, uh, Pamela Powers, who is here. And she is going to officially swear in uh, Mr. Kaufman as the Ward 6 school committee representative. So we'll do that before we call the meeting to order. Swear to you solemnly swear to faithfully and impartially to faithfully and impartially discharge the duties discharge the duties of the Northampton School Committee of the Northampton School Committee to which I have been elected to which I have been elected in accordance with the Constitution of the Commonwealth in accordance with the Constitution of the Commonwealth the city charter and ordinances the city charter and ordinances and the rules of the Northampton Public School and the rules of the Northampton Public School and the City of Northampton and the City of Northampton to the best of my knowledge and ability to the best of my knowledge and ability so help me God so help me God sure. congratulations <laughs> Congratulations, Mr. Kaufman. And so with that, I will now officially call to order the meeting of the uh, Northampton School Committee, Thursday, November 9th, 2017. And I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Ms. Present. Thank you very much. Uh, we now would move to the public comment period. And uh, I have a sign up list tonight and I would ask folks who have signed up to please step to the podium um, and please state your name and address for the record. Um, I will have a three minute timer here um, and we would ask you to please limit your remarks to three minutes. If I can get my three minute timer to work. Um, well, we may have to do it on the phone. Okay, the first person who signed up is Jonathan Brody. So thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak. Uh, last week, uh, my wife Paige was here speaking about our son Nate, uh, about his anxieties, about his sadness, uh, about his dimming enjoyment of school. Um, he's doing better. And so are some, maybe even many of his classmates. They're doing better because of a lot of hard work. Um, his hard work, our hard work as parents, dozens of hard work by uh, other dozens of parents, uh, his teachers, Mr. Dixon, uh, Tate Behavioral, uh, Dr. Plummer, Dr. Provost, uh, and Principal Chiquette. Um, the work for all of us was in part to endure, to problem solve, uh, to listen, to be accountable, to lead, and to lift. We literally lifted one classroom down the hall to another. On a side note, uh, Dr. Provost is actually really strong. <laughs> um, like, he literally risked a limb uh, at one point, moving this like ridiculously heavy cabinet. Uh, it was impressive. <laughs> and kind of glad we were there together. Um, it, uh, it's this kind of lifting that we need more of. Uh, 
we, uh, n it, we need this kind of lifting to lift the goal of inclusion to the reality of inclusion. And we need to lift our planning and our preparation and our organization towards sound and best general education practices, sound and best special education practices, and the noble pursuit of inclusion. We can lift hard, we can lift smart, but we certainly need to lift together. And we need you, all of you, to lift the budget and the staffing at Bridge Street School because we need you to lift our most vulnerable students in the district. We need you to lift up our most stretched and challenged teachers. We need you to lift up our neediest school and to lift our community, our entire community, to a level that is more socially just and educationally sound. Well timed, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, the next speaker is Ronnie Gold. And I just want to apologize. It appears that the next version of OS uh, has rendered my normal timer app uh, obsolete. So I'm going to have to update that later. So I'll be using the hand timer tonight. So, Mr. Gold. Um, my name is Ronnie Gold from 15 Linden Street. I'm a Bridge Street parent of two children in kindergarten, sorry, first grade and pre K. I'm also a uh, math instructional leadership specialist down in Springfield. Um, and I'm coming today to. Um, just talk a little bit about MCAS and some thoughts on MCAS to share with you as, I, as you go forward looking at the um, MCAS data that's being shared. Um, I come at this as an instructional leader in Springfield having looked at MCAS data for over a decade um, from a school view of over 800 students and 60 staff and what it can offer us. Um, and so I just want to talk about which ways we're going to be able to look at the data coming up and how it can influence decisions that are going to be made both by schools but also by ourselves on what we're going to invest in. Um, in many ways, the state is pushing this idea that MCAS is a fresh start. And this year, because they've changed the test, and last year was PARC, um, and so there's not a lot of comparative data. But I think in the end, there actually is a lot of comparative data, a lot of information from, that's happened previously and that the data provides for us. Um, you could take the bird's eye view and look at um, the percent meeting and exceeding here in uh, Northampton and how it compares to similar districts or compares to the state. Um, those kind of bird's eye views are helpful on some level, but really the street level view is what's most important. And I think that's what's most beneficial for you all to take a look at. Um, for instance, looking at Northampton schools versus schools, right? And then you'll see it. And what, one of the reasons I'm coming here is as a school council, uh, member in Bridge Street, we saw how much lower Bridge Street performed than the other three elementary schools. And that should be something that really we take a street level view and look at. Um, you could take the standards view and look at why was fractions such a difficult thing um, statewide, but also for Northampton schools. And then we could also look really at the question level um, and really see our third graders, should they be able to answer three times parentheses eight plus two is there another way to solve that? And only, we were 13% below the state in that. That's pretty concerning, I think, if you look at that one little skill for a third grade. So I, I'm trying to push the idea that we really look at that street level view and not get caught just in the bird's eye view, because the bird's eye view could look good, right? Um, and so in looking at that street level view, I think it's also important to look at, is our curriculum and our assessments aligned? I mean, if we've been using assessments for many years here in, in Northampton, and I'm new to what, you, what is going on in terms of curriculum here. But if we're using assessment that's been used for many years, is it really aligned to these new types of tests? Is our curriculum really aligned to these new types of tests? And if they are, is the data showing that? I mean, if we have aligned tests, that, is that really gonna show that our kids are improving like they are? So I think once you look at the MCAS data, take a look at is our curriculum and assessments aligned? Um, all this data should lead to action though. 
right? Like we shouldn't just look at this data and use it as um, food for thought, but which really lead to action. And bridge streets being so low, I hope that we take action um, as is needed. And I really hope that there's an investment made as you're making your budgetary decisions as to if a school is showing they need more investment in professional development and curriculum and training, um, that you make that going forward in your budgetary decisions. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Cindy Mahoney. Cindy Mahoney, I'm at 77 Emerson Way, and I'm here to talk about the late start issue. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, I'm the parent of a student in an upper grade at Bridge Street, and I sympathize with many of the first grade parents because the repercussions of the WINS model as it's implemented is impacting my child as well. The WINS model was implemented because of the high needs future, but what about the high needs present? ESPs, tiered support, school adjustment counselors are all part of the teaching staff because every adult in a school is teaching a child something, whether it's reading strategies in the classroom or regulating their emotions on the playground. Inclusion can be viewed as a big tent where ESPs are helping teachers hold up the tent poles so that all students can stay together. But if the ESPs are removed, then the teachers are left to try and hold up the tent by themselves, and they can't, and it starts to sag. And some kids can help hold up the tent. Some see it as kind of fun, because now the teacher can't see them so easily. But others are going to be frightened and overwhelmed by this billowing fabric, which is now blocking their way. In our case, teachers and staff have been compassionate, and we are grateful for their efforts. But school refusal has become a daily struggle and is escalating at home. School has sometimes been challenging in the past, but the shame, anger, sadness, and frustration our child is feeling this year has made for a very painful two months. She feels as though the rug has been pulled out from underneath her, saying, I don't feel successful. I wish I had the same support I had last year. And what's the difference between this year and last? It's the missing extra support provided by an ESP. My child's class has 15 students, but several have very serious medical conditions and several have significant social emotional challenges. So suddenly half the class is high need, and that's not counting the varying learning needs. This classroom teacher is thoughtful and working diligently However, the teacher's alone in a class where a child could physically or emotionally spike or crash. Under the WINS model is implemented in this upper grade at Bridge Street. The special ed teacher is co-teaching in the other classroom with the gen ed teacher and 25 students. And this is where the reality of scheduling logistics bumps up against the best practices theory of inclusion. How do the academic needs of both classes as mandated in IEPs get met? Despite the efforts of these teachers, Services are not always being provided as laid out in the service delivery grid. Remember that late start debate of several years ago which dragged on for years? In theory, like inclusion, it's a good idea, but the costs required to make it happen, cutting teachers, switching start times at the other schools, were prohibitive. This year, the WINS model was proposed and implemented within a very short time frame for such a radical change. It will be interesting to compare the estimated cost savings for the WINS model and the actual implementation costs. These, those costs may be exacerbated by families choosing other options for their children because of their frustrating experiences this year. Wouldn't it have been wiser educationally and financially to phase in this model as children disperse to home schools throughout the district? Inclusion is a worthy goal, but it's the implementation that's the hard part. And when the implementation is rushed, the children have been thrown into the deep end of the pool and the teachers are forced into the position of lifeguards. The teachers can see that some kids can swim on their own, some can tread water, but some are going to sink unless they get the extra support. Thank you. Thank you. The next person signed up is Lee Graham. Hello. Um, I don't actually have prepared remarks. I was hoping not to speak, but um, I wanted to continue to represent uh, special education families uh, in the first grade and, and also really sign on to what uh, Cindy just said. So like Jonathan, so my son is in first grade at Bridge Street. Um, I was in the Gazette, so you know I've been talking about this issue and have met with, with Dr. Provost and, and uh, the administration over this. We are really glad about how things have been moving forward, and it does feel, in, in many ways, things have stabilized quite a bit, which is a, a relief. But um, there's still a lot of work to be done, and I just feel the need to say that 
on the record to continue to um, encourage the school committee to, to work with us on this. One of the things that's coming up in the um, PAC discussions that we're having with, with other families is that WINS is working well in other places, and it, 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 te it seems like it's both school specific and grade specific. So some parents are really, and, and this is also true at Bridge, some parents are really um, glad for this, this model. And I think for, for us who are still really struggling, we wanna know what's working for them so that we can learn from it and think about how we can apply that to the places where it's still really a challenge. And so thinking about, you know, what are the lessons of success so far and um, applying them to the, the challenging areas. I think the other thing is, is that it hit me today when I was thinking about this, is that you know these disparities of the children who opted into Bridge for the substantially separate programs who are still there. You know, our our kids are in first grade. It's I don't know 2022 20, before they get out of Bridge if they all stay there. So so what are our plans for this cohort of children who began in Bridge in substantially separate programs or were drawn to it even if they weren't in those programs because of the expertise of the staff there? And how are we going to support this group as they move up through um, through fifth grade and hopefully stay there? You know, and so I think one of the other disparities that comes up across the elementaries is that many of the children who might be in these other places and struggling with implementation are at Bridge Street. And so we want to sort of think about what can we do for this school that's really holding up a lot of our, our children from around around the district. So, um, so thanks, keep supporting us, and let's keep thinking about how we can work together, especially as we start to think about uh, budgeting and funding and all of the, that good stuff that's coming down the pike. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next person who signed up is Anne-Marie Moggio. Anne-Marie Mojo on Spring Street in Leeds. I'm here sort of with two hats, one of a parent and uh, one as someone who has worked with Jim Myas, who has given efforts, effort, effortlessly to um, the youth in our community over the years. So you have on your agenda tonight um, the idea to name the field uh, behind Leeds School after Jim. So we are lucky enough to have been a family that has benefited from him. We played, our kids, both boys played on his little league team. And he does a summer ball that has been an amazing um, thing for kids for years and years um, in Northampton. So I asked the kids what are a couple of their favorite memories. Of course, they wouldn't come up and speak, but um, they did talk about the, the endless days of the summer league ball when the regular league ends. And uh, Jim would run this league up at, at Leeds School, which actually a lot of parents here remember too with their kids, where you would come up there and he would string up all these random things on a, on a rope t-shirts and basketball hoops on the nets and and on the fence and different things and if you hit the tennis ball into it you won that t-shirt or if you got it through that that net you might win some money or devil dogs box of devil dogs and ring dings <clears throat> those were some of his favorite things to give away so Jim has given to these kids he coached Little League for years and years and years and if you got on his team you were so excited and he had some crazy games, like I was saying. He also had one of the best things about being on his team is he had a team flag. So every game, he wrote up something about every single player, first of all, which is amazing in itself to have the time to do that as a coach. And then he had a player of the game. And if you were named the player of the game, you got to take this flag home. So it was this like seven foot flag that throughout 15, 20 years, I don't even know how long he had it. If you took it home, you got to add something to it. So it had t-shirts and socks and and uh, family pictures and pictures of dogs and things like that. So it's an it's incredible flag that has so many memories of children and teams and just was one of the, the little things that he did that we could speak, um, you know, lists and lists about in way more than three minutes. So that is um, some of the awesome baseball things and community things that, that we remember about Jim. Um, in my job as a director of Parks and Rec, I was fortunate enough to work with him and, and I can say, on that side of it too, he's one of the special pieces of our community that are that we've benefited from. And I've seen him give thousands and thousands of hours to um, the kids throughout the years, um, inside and outside. And he continues to do so, you'll hear from Mr. Kanata about he continues to do so at Leeds School um, in the after school programs and with the kids and with his grandkids that are now there. 
and things. So um, naming the field at the school in his honor is just completely deserving. I just wanted to step up and mention that. Um, there was other families who wanted to be here who couldn't because uh, the girls were at, are, have a <coughs> tonight. So a lot of families are at, at that. And um, some other families have gone away from the weekend. So I think you've gotten some letters in support also. I also have another one to hand in from the Serial family. And that's my three minutes. Nope. Um, oh, actually, I also wanted to mention the one thing, too. Um, um, in honor of Julie, Julie Clark, the gazebo up there, we actually got to go to lead school, our family, and Julie is an amazing, amazing piece of that school. Um, so she's totally deserving of that also. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that is all that has signed up. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment? Oh. Good evening, I'm Andrea Agito. I live at 431 Spring Street and I am the NACE teacher chapter coordinator um, for Unit A, our teachers and professional staff. I'd like to congratulate all of you on your re-election to this committee. Um, at a meeting this week at Bridge Street School, I heard Ms. Burnham say um, how, that, how communication is so important in challenging times. And I'm here tonight to request of each member of this committee to honestly communicate with your teachers, your staff, and families. When you restructured our elementary schools, you didn't listen to teachers that were urging you to pause and go slowly so that we could thoughtfully plan out the program pro properly. And now we're having to backtrack and to be reactive to solve huge problems in many of the elementary schools. It's not just Bridge Street School. Um, so those problems are across many of our schools. And so I'm here to urge you when you are making decisions about reallocating funds, and I want to thank you for the possibility of doing that, and thank you for the work that Dr. Provost has done in helping our Bridge Street staff and teachers um, and families work through some tough problems. But I'd like to ask you um, to Go into the schools, each of you. Ask teachers, ask staff members, talk to families, please. Things look very different in reality than they do on paper. And quite often, I know in busy times, it's really hard for all of you <coughs> to get out there. And I was really honored at the two parent meetings at Bridge Street School. We had multiple committee members there and, and our teachers and our staff, and I know the families really appreciate that. And I am here to beg you to do that more and to really look. Dr. Provost has gotten quite the education, in many cases, being a one-on-one -on -one support aide for students at Bridge Street School. Um, he's gotten his shoes poured water on. He's gotten kicked and watched students having really challenging issues, and I know that that's making him a better leader. And so I ask all of you to possibly do the same. And when you're there, talk to a staff member, talk to a teacher. They will be honest with you and tell you what's really needed, rather than being reactive and just, in many cases, pouring good money after bad, so to speak. I don't know if that's the right analogy. But listen to our staff and to our experts in the classrooms. They can tell you exactly what's needed. And then make your decisions. And I know you'll make the right ones for everybody involved. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment? Okay, um, hearing none, we'll uh, now move to announcements. Are there any announcements from members of the school committee? Next Friday, November 17th, is Arts Night In at Northampton High School from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, there will be art installations, photography, and video presentations, live music, and theater. Um, and there's no charge for <coughs> that event. All are welcome. Okay. Any other announcements? Okay, hearing none, uh, we'll move into recommended actions. Um, we have a consent agenda this evening that includes the approval of minutes of the school committee meeting of February 14th, 2017, as well as the school committee meeting with the student advisory committee 
October 12th, 2017. We also have two field trip requests, the NHS Chorus uh, going to a Broadway show in New York City on March 28th, 2018, and the NHS Band going to a festival at Carnegie Hall, New York City, March 28th through the 31st of 2018. And I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Okay. Is there a second? Okay. All those in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The consent agenda is adopted. We'll now move into the reports and recommendation, uh, recommendations. And we have, a, uh, as, as always, a report from our student representative, Elena Fragamini. Hi, good evening. I just want to start off by congratulating girls soccer on advancing to the semifinals. Um, they're playing tonight. I suppose it's ended by now. I don't know the results, but hoping for a win. Um, this is the first time, I believe, either the first time ever or the first time in a really long time that they've advanced to Western Mass semifinals. So we really want to congratulate the girls soccer program at Northampton High. Um, Northampton High has officially opened a new single stall gender neutral bathroom on the third floor. Previously, there were just two single stall gender neutral restrooms on the first floor. Um, this comes after a lot of collaborative work between the NHS administration, the Gender Sexuality Alliance, Feminist Collective, and the Student Union, who all worked together for a long time to make this change. This year's Clash of the Classes, which is a new version of which was previously the Powder Puff game, will be held on November 15th at 5 p.m. in the Northampton High Stadium, and the proceeds will go to Northampton High senior class, I believe, to help with prom and graduation and all that. Um, in an effort to make the game more inclusive, the name has been changed from Powder Puff to Clash of the Classes. Um, also, gender non-binary students are encouraged to play in what has traditionally been a flag football game between junior and senior girls. During halftime, uh, to make this truly a clash of the classes, sophomores and freshmen will have an opportunity to play some sort of halftime game, and there will also be a halftime show. So if you'd like to come, that's November 15th at 5 p.m. Um, this month, I want to highlight a few initiatives from the Northampton High Environmental Club. Tonight, they are hosting a Heat Smart Information Session at Northampton High, which is part of an initiative to help residents save on their ener energy bills while also reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Last Sunday, they co-sponsored a Reclaiming Our Future March with Climate Action Now and the Young Democrats Club of NHS, along with many other community organizations. This event was specifically focused on youth participants and offered the opportunity for youth to be the speakers at a rally in front of City Hall in which they demanded a healthy future for all and a move towards sustainable energy policies. And Thursday, November 16th, they will be hosting a screening of Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth at 7 p.m. in the High School Black Box Theater. And Ms. Fallon kind of stole this one from me, but Arts Night In, I just want to, give a, I want, to, I want to give another pitch for everyone to come to Arts Night In. It's really a fantastic opportunity for the high school to showcase everything from fine arts and visual arts and performing arts. Free of charge, again, 6 to 8 next Friday, and I hope you all can make it. Thank you very much. The uh, next item on the agenda is the first reading on the naming of the baseball diamond at Leeds Elementary School in honor of Jim Myas. Um, and I know that uh, the Ward 7 uh, representative uh, may speak to that, and I know that uh, Principal Sal Canada is here as well. So if you'd like to. Okay, Principal Canada. We recognize him, so we can. We, we recognize you. Yeah, we, we recognize you. Even without the Dr. Seuss hat, we recognize you. Tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Michael, for allowing me to be here. So, Jim Myas, I, I, put, I put together some, some words, and Emery spoke pretty eloquently, and I know that you're in receipt of, uh, I've seen at least five or six letters, all of which are just amazing, but who is this guy, this Jim Myas guy? First of all, I hope he's the guy that doesn't know this is happening because it's a surprise. And for six months, we're going to have to keep it a, a real secret if we can do that. But who is this guy? Who's that guy you see around on that unique bike with the milk crate and the toys and the feathers and I'm sure other things he finds on the ground and puts on the back of his bike for conversation pieces? He rides that bike everywhere. I've seen it in Worcester. I've, I've heard it makes its way to the casino. And I've seen him driving down 202 in Shootsbury on my way back from Maine two summers ago. Um, <laughs> He's everywhere on that. I tend to think he was green way before anybody else ever was. He's that guy with that crazy hairdo. He's that guy with the clothes that uh, make him look an awful lot like Neil Young. Um, he's, you find him at Leeds Mart every morning getting the coffee going, or you find him at, at Bird's. Um, and he is a presence at Leeds Elementary School where he's a grandfather, a father.
father. He's a husband. Um, he's an amazing volunteer. I find him in our kindergarten reading with the kids or tutoring them in math. Or last year he let the kids shave his beard. You know, um, at a variety show we have, he's the MC and he wears his Bobby Knight sport coat. Um, he uh, he runs a mock election every year gets the voting booths out there so the kids can vote for their favorite t-shirt and he's the warden and he gives out the I just voted uh, stickers and um, he volunteers in our library and every week with me or mostly him but <laughs> my ideas and his ideas he changes the sign at Leeds once a week and I, I was doing that for a long time and it takes a while and I uh, we, we come up with ideas and his personality definitely shows through when he does that he's on the playground in the morning he's there after school he became a LEAP instructor, which is our enrichment program, a couple of years ago, and he continues his tradition of baseball. Um, Jim's a guy who worked for 35 years at the VA, and then he bought a house close, close by, and he knows everybody. And for Jim, he sees the best in people. He really does. He's a friend to all. He's real. He's genuine. He always has a kind word for everyone. And Jim doesn't do it for recognition, and he doesn't do it for fame, and he certainly doesn't do it for compensation. Um, and the letters that you receive, they, they share personal stories and they document decades of service. But for me, he's just a great guy, a wonderful person, someone I consider a friend and someone I value and someone I can depend on. And uh, he's a guy that if we had a title, I'd call him the king of leads. And I, I joke with him too. I said this to him about a week ago. I can't wait to be his age so we can hang out. <laughs> and, uh, I'm unaware if he's religious or spiritual in any way, but I believe Jim uh, truly lives by some words that Gandhi's credited with. And that's... Uh, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others, and that's what Jim does. So uh, naming the ball field behind Leeds would be an amazing tribute and uh, something I would be so proud to be a part of and see every day at my work there. Thank you. Official season ends. That's when the, the Maya season begins, and it just lasts and lasts and lasts until the cold weather comes, and it never fails. There's always a crew of kids, from about three feet tall to you know five six out there. Also, um, kids in my neighborhood have talked about the legendary tennis ball games up at the school. So, um, it's with great pleasure that I ask that the committee take under consideration the name of Jim Myas for the baseball diamond at Leeds Field. Thank you. Um, so this is a first reading. So I think it's the first of how many? Six. 12 readings? Oh, six <laughs> readings. OK. We have a long <laughs> multiple reading process. Um, so uh, so that will count as our first reading. Can we find out a new fact about him every time? Yes. <laughs> okay, you're going to have to come up with a. Can I challenge you? You've got five Sal, more speeches to write. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'll accept that. Um, so next we'll move on to another first reading. This is the naming of the playground pavilion at Leeds Elementary um, in honor of Julie Clark. Um, and again, I believe uh, Mr. Kanata is here to speak to that as well. All right. Nice to be back. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I sent uh, a letter for you all to see. And again, uh, to name the pavilion after Julie Clark is is also an honor and a privilege. Um, and it's also a secret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. So what I'd, ra what I'd like to do is you have my letter, and uh, I'd rather read it, just so there is pe there are people here tonight and there's people watching. So um, I'm, I want to name the new pavilion, and I would like the committee support uh, located behind Lee's Elementary School after a longtime administrative assistant, Julie Clark. So Julie spent much of her life at Leeds. She was a student at Leeds, so she was there at five years old as a kindergartner, and I'm not going to say how old she was when she left as administrative assistant, but um, she raised her three children who went through Leeds. Her grandchildren, three of her grandchildren uh, went to Leeds, and then she, the last 27 years of her career, was as the administrative assistant. Um, she was there through six different principals. So she was there with the legendary Kay Sheehan, through Dr. Gail Furman, Dr. Suzanne Scallion, Kathy Malinowski, Joseph Smith, and myself. So over those years, as the administrative assistant, and I'm sure all you know, she was the face, she was the voice, she was the first impression for what, what must number in the thousands of children and families who were all part of the Leeds community. Um, my own experience will tell you that it was my, my first principalship, and I couldn't imagine walking in or having any measure of reasonable success or that the school has had um, 
success with without her insight, without her knowledge, and without her genuine love for that Leeds community. Um, her work touched every effort, I'm sorry, every aspect of Leeds Elementary School, and her title was Administrative Assistant, and I want to share some words uh, um, that I shared at her retirement party, some of the critical roles that she filled. Um, although they weren't, they weren't her title, she was a friend, she was a confidant, she was a mother, a grandmother, a judge, a jury, a priest, a therapist, a behaviorist, a psychologist, a critic, an accountant, an inventory control specialist, a comedian, a counselor, a scheduler, a security guard, a conscience, a voice of reason, but most importantly and always a dogged advocate for Leeds Elementary School and those kids. And she left as Leeds family matriarch, is what I called her. Um, so while she accomplished a lot in her position, there's two things that stand out above the rest. And she founded both the Early Bird and Late Bird program and the LEAP program. So Early Bird and Late Bird are our before and after <coughs> school programs. And they provide and continue to provide uh, parents an affordable before and after school care option. Um, it also provides some school employees with some, an option to earn some additional income. And uh, the LEAP program, which stands for Leeds, Leeds Enrichment After School Program, she founded that as well. And it's now being run by her daughter, Shannon Daniels. Um, it provides students with enrichment opportunities. These range in, from art to violin to Chinese to sports to and everything in between. And Julie ran both these programs for many years uh, without any compensation, and she never sought any. So why the pavilion, and why not a room, or why not the office suite? And my answer was simple. Is Julie was always thinking about how students and families could best be served, but more importantly, how we can keep everybody happy. And the two programs certainly have that focus and they utilize what the school has to offer. You know, we have a large cafetorium, an expansive playground, a soccer field, beautiful gardens and play structures. But sometimes students just want to relax and read or be out of the sun or out of the rain and that pavilion provides a wonderful option. It also, it's a beautiful place where parents and families are starting to gather, they relax, they talk, they catch up. Um, and in a way it helps to, in our ongoing quest to create community. So the cost to build the pavilion didn't come from the school budget, as you know, or city coffers, but rather with the money earned through the revolving account for late bird, early bird, and leap. And the funds, the funds that come from those programs must directly benefit the programs, and these programs would not exist in their present form if it wasn't for Julie Clark. So Julie was a steady, visible presence for many years at Leeds, and I'm hopeful the pavilion will also stand proud as a steady presence serving our students and families for many years to come. So thank you for this for considering this proposal if you have a chance to come and take a look at it when all the other construction is done it'll look so much nicer <laughs> you know behind there but it, it really is a beautiful little structure and the, the kids are starting using the families are starting to use it and it fits in nice in our in our, in our uh, the back of the school okay. uh, so for the seven years that my boys were at Leeds I'm truly <coughs> was a steady uh, and, and great, great presence every time walking to the building I know I would see her there and um, I'm not sure that the surprise may be difficult because I know she watches these meetings. <laughs> uh, because as an, as an advocate for, uh, for Leeds and for the students in Northampton generally, she would let me know whether she approved of my actions uh, the night before or whether she thought I needed, I needed some further counsel. Um, so, but in any event, I think it would be a great honor I ask that the committee take under consideration her name for the Pavilion of Leeds School. So she is watching. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, that will uh, constitute our first reading, unless there's any other comments. Great. Okay. Um, next, we will have a report uh, from uh, Ms. McLaughlin on the archiving of social media. It's a presentation. without throwing up something on there the
Okay, so Antonio and I are here today to present about <coughs> uh, basically archiving social media. We'll let that load for a second. And basically, social media and record keeping is the content of this presentation. And if you want to go ahead to proceed to the second slide for us. Remember that light touch on the key? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was exciting. Clean your filter. <laughs> you go to Chrome at the bottom, Antonio. All the way oh. over. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think the Nile split in two. Strange people wanted to walk across it. I was not. social media and public records keeping. And so one of the things that when uh, the law came out about us having public record requests done and whatnot, there's a lot of in-depth, I actually read it, it was quite interesting, but there's a lot of data behind that. And one of the new aspects that there's become more and more of a focus on is what about the social media account? So as we all know, Dr. Provost is a big Twitter. Uh, there are many other people who are also big Twitters in our district. And really what's happening now is this move to say, well, these places are considered a public record. And so within this, the public records guidelines of the Commonwealth, there's, the, there's a little statement that's kind of say, that says, you know, you really need to keep an eye on these accounts because those are also considered able to be called for public record. But it's not even just the current feed of these particular things. It includes anything such as comments back and forth can be considered public record, things that were added, deleted, removed um, from like however many years back. And so one of the reasons that we came today to present on a potential solution for this is because of this particular guideline. It does say that you do need to be able to retrieve the data in a reasonable amount of time. And so we, were, we have to look at what are some options for doing this. The options we were looking at is the uh, company called Archive Social. This is a company that is currently one that is the city is using to deal with their public records keeping, and it allows us an option to kind of have both the city and the school participate in a way to resolve this maintenance and record keeping per se on social social feeds. So I'm going to trade places with Antonio. We'll keep Okay, one thing that uh, we talked when we were talking about the um, IT reorganization was to uh, ensure that we uh, share resources uh, as much as possible, um, licensing, software, and things like that. So since um, uh, the schools uh, use uh, Twitter mostly and Facebook and other uh, tools as, as much as this, uh, the city does, so even more in some, in some cases, we decided that it would be a, a good opportunity for us to uh, partner together on a solution that the city has been using for a couple of years. One of the things that are important about uh, having a system like Archive Social is, um, we are, maybe you don't know about this, but every piece of information that is uh, on the computer, whether it is uh, a file, whether it's an email, or whether it's a tweet, uh, it has to be, we have to be accountable for them, and even if the person that created also go and delete uh, the record, we are responsible for keeping that record. Obviously, because we don't own Twitter, yeah, for, for some reason we should be <laughs> owners of something like that. Uh, we, we cannot assure that we can um, archive those, those records, and then archive social is uh, uh, 
one of the solutions where basically every time that an information becomes available in these platforms, it's captured and basically is copied into a server. And if the person goes a second later and delete it, it is still uh, archived. So that is the, the major reason for that. And uh, we can do, uh, as Mr. Provost, uh, Dr. Provost knows, uh, we can do search by, by keywords and by names and uh, we can retrieve information, it doesn't matter when it was done or whether it was deleted or not. So those, that's the reason why we do it. Uh, the other reason is uh, by partnering together uh, between the city and the schools, we can basically, uh, instead of having uh, one account for each one, we share the same account, and then we basically share the, co the, the, the cost. Instead of paying for two accounts, we pay for one account, and because it's unlimited accounts or it's unlimited, um, users on on the account, we can save up to 3,000 records a month, which it could be a little challenging with Dr. Provost uh, using Twitter, <laughs> but I think that we can make it. <laughs> so that is basically what we're proposing. Go ahead and do it. This is something important for the system and I think it's a, it's a um, testament of how we can really share resources uh, in other areas in the future. Any questions? <laughs> yes. So who is this covering? Like are, when you say that you, social media accounts, are you just saying the school committees? Or are you saying just school employees? That is, that is a good uh, word. Here is the definition that I normally use. If the person that is using social media or email for, for that fact uh, is representing the school, is a representative of the school, the record needs to be archived. If it's a person that is uh, on the community and speaks about the school, but is not a representative of the school, uh, it doesn't need to be archived unless it's interacting with an official from the school. For example, if a, if a community member um, replied to uh, Dr. Provost, sorry, John, I'm, I'm using you, but uh, <laughs> uh, tweet back to Dr. Provost and reply, uh, that information because it's replying to something that was generated by the official <laughs> of the school, it becomes archival of, of, of uh, information that needs to be archived. So essentially any of the teachers who currently are using Twitter or who are having like, let's say a Facebook page or whatnot, those are accounts that would be registered under this unlimited account. And technically if they're using it, and if you see like again on the website that we presented, you know, the, the feed that's on the side, you know, Sal has his Twitter feed for Leeds, Beth has one for Bridge Street. Those, because they are related to the school and they're representing themselves as you know, representatives of the school system, those would be part of the recorded accounts. Uh, technically, unless you like write a disclaimer like, in no way am I affiliated with Northampton schools, it, it could be considered a public records request. Yeah, for example, if, uh, if I, use, I use my Twitter account using my email, my Gmail account, my personal Gmail account. And in my profile, I don't mention that I represent the Hunter Public Schools. I, that one doesn't need to be, even if I am talking about the school, it doesn't need to be archived. But if for some reason, as uh, Molly mentioned, in my profile, I mentioned that I'm uh, an official or, or a person representing the schools, then uh, we have the obligation to archive that account. Yes. Um, how does this extend to like student organizations within the school system, their social media? That is a, a very good uh, uh, question. I think that part of the social media uh, policy uh, talks about uh, how you know who within the school um, could represent the school. For example, if if it's a, uh, a student organization, it is not representing the school itself; it's representing the students. Okay. That is in in the state um, uh, law that is not considered to be an official page or, or account of the schools. Okay. Thank you. So um, I apologize if you said this before, but what, so how, once it's archived, what happens to it? Is it, do we save it for a number of years or? Yes, I, I, story? I believe I, I need to verify that, but I think that we have set up for seven years uh, retention. They have several options when, when we do the uh, account configuration. 
and it's set up for seven years, which I believe is, is, is the case. But I, I can verify that, to be sure. So does it just sit there? Is it in you know, a lock sort of file, and it sits there in case somebody makes a request? Or is, is it something that is reviewed or made available in any other oh, way? Oh, yes. I, I understand the question now. Yeah, it sits there. No, nobody no, does anything with that, unless there is a request. If there is a request, we can go there, and by doing searching uh, by date, there's several uh, ways to do the searching. Then we can export out as a PDF uh, if, if it's requested that way. And the cost, I'm sorry, the, the cost is 2500 per school or per district? What, what does for that the mean? District, uh, for the school, for one year school district. For the school district. Because, okay. like yeah. we said, we're partnering with the city, so yeah. like the actual, yeah. Thank you. Are we done with this? There's another question? Yeah, you said Facebook also? <coughs> yes. So uh, student groups, clubs, obviously that would be archived. Book, right? Yes. No. Okay, I thought I asked. No. So that no. Was sort of a, no. That no. was a question. That. Yeah. So <coughs> if, if it's student affiliated, that's it. But if it's like. No, no. The, like the teacher of the club. Yes. Okay. Like if a teacher that. had a pay, like a so Facebook the, the page. Club. Okay. Then yes. Yes. It would be. So then my other question would be, a school committee member, personal Facebook, and someone says, "Congratulations, Laura Fallon, on being a school committee member. Now you're recognized. Is that?" She's recognized as on a political campaign, but not. But not yeah. for the Facebook. Not of, not so. Awesome. Yeah. Clearly, so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so the next. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a presentation by Dr. Provost of our 2017 MCAS results. I assume we're going back to another. Presentation. I'm sorry. Uh, if you can leave the back ones on, that would be good. That's okay. There are actually two sub segments of the agenda in one PowerPoint, so I'm counting on you guys. <laughs> As Mr. Gold said in his comments tonight, there are many ways to look at MCAS results and different levels of analysis. What we'll be discussing tonight is in part bird's eye view, in part somewhat less than bird's eye view, maybe treetop view. Um, we won't be talking about the sort of individual item analysis that happens at a building level with the, the school data teams. Um, but we'll be looking specifically at three topics. One is differentiating up, which was one of our district initiatives last year. Second is transitioning to MCAS 2.0. I agree that um, with Mr. Gold that even though this is an accountability pause and reset year, there are ways of looking across the both, both assessments to try to see what type of trends are apparent. And also, um, looking a little bit more closely at opportunity gaps this year than I have in the past, um, just because in the effort to try to make sense of the transition from the traditional MCAS to MCAS 2.0, um, I realized some things about opportunity gaps that we really haven't discussed explicitly and that I think sort of get masked when you're sort of in the um, habit of just reporting year after year after year on the same test. So in a sense, looking at the MCAS with a new set of eyes brings out some information I'd like to share about opportunity gaps. So first topic is differentiating up. 
As you recall, we received some feedback from the community concerning whether or not students were being met with a sufficient level of challenge. Um, this was specifically um, discussed more at the middle and high school level and specifically discussed more with reference to math than ELA. And we addressed that in the district improvement plan by launching an initiative last year around differentiating up. Um, and we had identified as a key measure of that whether or not we were increasing the percentage of students in the advanced category on MCAS. So basically we're saying proficient isn't good enough, we need to have more advanced to measure or not whether or not we're providing a sufficient level of challenge. That one thing that we didn't anticipate when we set that goal and set that measure was last year was going to be the transition to MCAS 2.0. So that wiped out a great deal of the data set because one thing that absolutely isn't comparable is what the top level on the old MCAS was and what the top level on the new MCAS is. So we um, basically were left with 10th grade data, biology data, and science technology and engineering at um, grades eight and five. So we'll be looking at those to see if there's evidence that differentiating up was a successful strategy for us. So these next several slides, I'll have the same format. Um, the bars, <coughs> colors on the bars represent different subgroups within the school. Um, the blue bar is high needs subgroup. The red bar is non-high needs students and green is all students and just as a refresher, high needs students are students who are either economically disadvantaged, ELLs, students with disabilities, they can belong to multiple categories within the high needs group. Um, Non-high needs are students who don't belong to any of those categories. And then in each of these charts you see where we were in 2016 prior to the initiative and then where we were in 2017 after the initiative and this is reporting only the percentage of students from those groups that were in the advanced category. Um, so you can see in 2016 we were um, below the statewide averages in both the high needs um, group and the non-high needs group but we were average for all students. Isn't that interesting? Because all students is made 100% of high needs and non-high needs. Um, so this is sort of the first thing that started me thinking about equity and, and opportunity gaps. Um, however, I'll get to that later. Looking at 2017, you can see that in 10th grade ELA, all three of the subgroups made significant improvement and we're now above statewide comparisons. So I think um, there's reason to believe that the press we made for increasing rigor and increasing challenge um, bears some, bore some fruit in terms of pushing more kids into the advanced level of MCAS. Next, mathematics. Um, this is uh, kind of a different chart. In 2016, the high needs groups, group in Northampton was quite a bit above the statewide average. In 2017, they maintained their advantage, but only by one point. So I think the um, effort in mathematics didn't show the same kind of um, across the board improvements that we saw in ELA. However, uh, the non-high needs students in, improved their performance pretty dramatically, going from 70% advanced to 77% advanced, and therefore the all students group also increased um, and it extended their advantage on the all students subgroup statewide. For science, we took a look just at ninth grade biology. We wanted to exclude from the analysis students who had taken biology in the year prior to the real push for um, differentiating up. Um, so this is just last year's ninth graders compared to the prior year's ninth graders. Um, and again, I think you see 
strong improvements in the percentage of students in the advanced category in all three levels. In 2016, we were um, above statewide averages for all three subgroups. In 2017, we're even higher, more farther above statewide averages in all three subgroups. And our um, all students subgroup at Northampton High School was higher than the non-high needs average for the state. So that was a really strong improvement in the advanced category. Next, uh, this is eighth grade science, technology, and engineering. Someone, one of the members who had gotten the, the presentation in the packet asked, why is there no blue bar in 2017? And that's because 0% of the high need students at JFK were advanced in 2017. But look at what it's compared to. This is why I think comparisons to statewide averages are always important. Um, the high need subgroup had 0%, but they were only 1% below the state. I, I don't know what it is about this test, um, but I, I would suggest there's something different about the way they set the bar for the advanced <coughs> category in 2017 because 1% of high need students in the state were advanced, 5% of non high need students in the state were advanced, and only 3% of all students in the state were advanced. So um, there's a difference there, but it's a difference that I don't find concerning when you compare it to the statewide um, results. Next is science, technology, engineering, grade five. Um, this looks more like the other charts. Now, one thing I'll note is that there's no all students um, subgroup reported for these students because the analysis you have to do is different. Um, we are looking at the whole district rather than individual schools. The all students um, data is reported by the individual school level, um, but instead of putting them all together into a weighted average, I just presented the, the results that are available at the district-wide level, which is the high needs and the all students subgroup. You can see that in 2016, the high needs and all students subgroups were below statewide averages. In 2017, they were tracking right on the money with statewide averages. So saw strong improvements there in grade five as well. What happened in the other grades, we don't know because we transitioned to MCAS 2.0. There's no longer a um, advanced category in MCAS 2.0. There is the uh, exceeds expectation category, but as you know from the statewide data I shared with you last week, very small percentages of students make it into that category. So if this continues to be an important um, goal for the committee, then I think we will need to do a pause and reset and, and think about what that highest category means in the next version of the test. Okay, so that's just looking at us compared to statewide averages. It's also fair to look at us compared to similar districts. And that's what the next set of data shows. Um, these are comparable districts identified through the Department of Education's DART tool. These are comparable in terms of student demographics, not necessarily comparable in terms of district ability to fund. So um, looking at ELA, we were the fourth among comparable districts. We were the top in Western Massachusetts. Um, whether we can go much farther, I don't know. Um, if you look at the Melrose district, that may be a district that, that <coughs> could aspire to try to match. They have similar funding as well as similar demographics, so we may have a few more points left that we could squeeze out of pushing kids into advanced. Um, I'm not sure that Falmouth and Nosset are attainable. Um, because Falmouth is spending $2,000 more per student, Nosset's spending $5,000 more per student. Those are both districts that benefit from having boothies sitting on beaches all summer long, charging $20 a car for people who really don't use any services. It's kind of a different funding model than we have here locally. But 
I think it's for people who wonder if there's challenge and sufficient rigor in Northampton, I think it's important to be able to say that if you want to do better, you have to probably go to the Cape, right? We are, for a district with our type of students, the tops in Western Mass. In math, same kind of situation. Um, we're third among comparable schools, highest in Western Mass comparables. Um, again, there's quite a bit of a spending gap between Northampton and the next two districts. So I'm not sure how much more we can squeeze out of pushing kids into advanced. Um, looking at biology, here's one where I think maybe we can do better, um, in part because I'd like to run the table in Western Mass, and in part because I'm a former employee, Bagwam. Um, it's a similar district and similar in spending. They do have a little bit more of an ability to fund because of Six Flags, um, which is a more than a million dollar a year taxpayer that, again, takes no services, really. Um, but uh, if we look at an area in the high school where we may want to um, continue to push higher levels and, and more rigorous courses, maybe the biology courses want to take a look at. Um, so this is what the, that grade eight science looks like. So looking at our comparables, we're basically in a four-way tie for the bottom, but there's only a five-point difference between the bottom and the top. Um, a small difference in achievement could make a huge difference in this ranking. Um, but again, what does that mean? You know, if you if you have six percent of students advanced as compared to one percent of students advanced not on a test that that is really hard for kids to be advanced and i'm not sure what that means next is fifth grade science um, and you can see again we're the highest among western mass comparables we fourth among all of our comparable districts all of those districts to the right of us, the three districts to the right of us are districts that have uh, a greater ability to fund than we do. So there may be a little bit more growth there. I'm not sure how much more growth there is. Um, but I think, again, a good showing to be the best in Western Mass. Yes? What happened to some of the other comparables that you saw? Like so, right. So the, the, here. the comparables for the elementary schools are different than the comparables for the middle and high school because their makeup is different. Okay. One of the things um, that has been discussed tonight in public speak and will be discussed later on in my presentation is the demographics of the elementary schools are quite different than the demographics mm -hmm. of the high school. So that's why they get a different comparison group. You. You're welcome. So. Um, Next, next thing I want to talk about is the transition to MCAS 2.0. And one of the methods you can use to try to carry through patterns is compare the, the percentage of your students you had in the top two groups on the prior MCAS as, and the percentage of those who were in the top two groups on the new MCAS relative to the statewide average. So what you're doing for that is you're basically controlling but for the difference in the rigor of the test by always just showing how, how much you're varying from the average. When it was an easier test, everybody was higher, but you're only showing the difference from the mean. And when it was a harder test, everyone was lower, but again, you're only showing the difference in the mean. Um, the 2016 data has to be imputed because that was the year that half of the state was taking park, and so the state didn't even attempt to say what the averages were. Um, so you'll see those represented as dotted lines in the next slides. And I'll just talk about these, these two, or these, these cohorts for these two subjects. So first is English language arts. Um, so the blue line are the oldest students. Those are the current ninth graders. You can see that um, they started out in third grade, below state average declined from third to fourth, started to recover in fifth, and made a strong improvement in middle school. That's one of the things that I think is an important part of the story of the data this year. The performance at middle school was really strong. 
Um, and looking at the same groups of kids, they made a great deal of progress from where they were in elementary school while they were in JFK. Um, the next set, next oldest kids are the red lines, red students. These are this year's eighth graders. This is a group that started um, in third grade above average in terms of the, num the percentage of students in the top two categories. And at the end of seventh grade, we're well above, more than 10% above. This is the highest performing group of kids we have. They're still in eighth grade this year. One of the things that I have talked to Leslie about is it's conceivable that JFK could be the best in class for its comparable schools. Um, so the next oldest group is the green group. Um, those are our current seventh graders. See, they, they've been like tr true. I mean, there's a regression line on there, but you could have just drawn it with a ruler because they're going, their, their performance is improving in you know, equal increments as they go through the, the process. So again, that's a really strong group. That's a group that's going into seventh grade. It's a group that's going into seventh grade possibly with higher scores than the group that just went to seventh grade. We don't know because you know, we're imputing that data. But um, three really, or two really strong cohorts at the middle school right now. The next oldest kids are the purple groups. Those are the kids who are coming, currently sixth graders. Um, you can see they started out um, below average, made steady progress through elementary school. Hopefully that's a, pro a pattern that continues at middle school. If they do anything like the prior kids in the blue group and the red group, they should do well also. Um, there's no data for the current fifth graders because last year there was no statewide average. Um, the circle represents where last year's third graders started out. So they're kind of in the middle. If you compare to all the different um, starting points for the different cohorts that have come through, sort of the middle of the road beginning point. Next, looking at math, um, an area of greater struggle for the district. And the um, cohort colors are the same, so the blue our, our current <coughs> freshmen at NHS, they started about 20% below statewide average in third grade. Um, they kind of crept up towards the end of elementary school, dived back down in sixth grade, and then uh, made it back up by the end of eighth grade. They've taken out about half of the distance from where they started to average. Um, so that's a, that's a group that will be testing in 10th grade next year. Uh, the next group is current eighth graders, just as it was the case in ELA, their strongest group in math. They started 10% below the statewide average in third grade and now about 10% above the statewide average. Um, and moving on to eighth grade, I think that bodes well for what, what may happen here at JFK next year. Of all these groups, the one that I'm, I have some concerns about is this next group. It's the current seventh graders um, who started off poorly and seem to get worse. Um, so those kids are going into seventh grade now. Um, that's an area where I think I would like to I would like to personally put some more focus into trying to figure out what they need. Um, of all of them, that's the one that I worry about. So um, again, the purple group, much as they were in in ELA are kind of a steady eddy class. They started out um, below, like all the rest of the cohorts, but have made some progress from third to fifth, and hopefully that will continue as they enter sixth grade. Again, there's no data for fifth grade because of the park um, data confusion. And our third graders are starting out, this current batch of third graders are starting out in a better position than any of the cohorts that have gone before. So hopefully that will be our strongest performing group of kids yet. Okay. So next, um, you have all seen the result of this. So this is really a thought experiment for the public watching tonight. So if you can imagine Main Street Elementary School where students in the high need subgroup scored in the 25th percentile and students in the non-high needs group scored in the 27th percentile, 
where would you think the upper and lower limits of the all students group would be? Elena, do you want to venture a guess? No. All right. <laughs> I'll pass. When, <laughs> when I first saw this data, I thought there had to be a mistake because when I think of that, that kind of data set, I think if that's 100% of the students, the average of everyone has to be somewhere between 25 and 75. This is what I thought, but that wasn't true. <laughs> How does that happen? <laughs> Do not know. Um, this next data starts looking at the effects of opportunity gaps and looks at some of the differences in student demographics at our elementary schools. So look at Bridge Street School. In, in all these, let me just explain the, the, the bars first. The blue represents the achievement percentile for the high needs subgroup. The red represents the achievement percentile for the non-high needs subgroup. Green represents the achievement percentile for all students. And purple is just the percent of high needs students who took the test last year at the school. So if you look at Bridge Street School, their high needs kids were the 23rd percentile. Their non-high needs kids were at the 34th percentile. But when you put them all together, the whole school is only at the 21st percentile. And how that happens is the high needs, or the all students um, percentile ranking is just based on all the rest of the schools in the Commonwealth. So if you have a higher percentage of students in the high needs subgroup who are performing lower on average than students in the non-high needs subgroup, you can have a percentile ranking for your whole school that's lower than any of the subgroups in the school. And that's one of the, that's one of the um, problems with the system. It's one of the problems with um, the way kids are currently distributed in our district. It's one of the reasons why unwinding the system of sending all high needs kids to Bridge Street is so important. Um, this happens to other schools too in our district, and it happens the other way. We have some schools where the all students subgroup is higher than any of the subgroups that make up all students. I'll show you that in the next slide. But um, what you can see here is how the how the different subgroups fared in each of the each of the schools, looking at um, their achievement percentiles in English language arts in general. Kids in the non-high needs group were doing better, much better than statewide averages, sometimes in the top quartile of performance. And kids who were in the high needs were in the lower third, more or less, of performance. Now remember, that's not relative to the absolute mean. That's relative to their subgroup. So that means that our high needs students are the ones who are really not performing in the district. Um, I talked to the, to the Jackson Street PTO last night and was sort of riffing on my concerns about the high needs subgroup. It's because of this. You know, we don't, it's not just that there's a difference between the performance of the non high needs and the high needs kids. Everybody has that. But there's a difference in our ability to serve high needs kids relative to all the high needs kids in the state. Is that clear? So this next one is looking at math. And you have the opposite effect at Leeds. Um, so if you look there, their high needs kids were the 25th percentile. Their non-high needs kids were the 35th percentile. But their, everybody was at the 39th percentile. And you look at the purple bar, you can see it's the purple bar that is the lowest of all the schools. It's there they get kind of an advantage based on based on the fact of their low enrollment of high needs kids. Um, at Ryan Road, they have the same issue as Bridge in the prior slide. They're also a group that, um, they're also a school that has the second highest portion of high needs test takers. And in, as you can see, the green bar is lower than the blue or the red because their high need, their overall percentile rank is lower than the percentile ranking of any of the kids that goes into the high needs, uh, that, that goes into the, the percentile ranking. Um, 
I'll also point out, if you just compare Bridge Street and Jackson, kind of interesting. Um, Bridge Street had a higher percentile ranking in its high needs population and in its non-high needs population, but its percentile ranking as a school overall was lower than Jackson Street. So they did better with the high needs kids, they did better with the non-high needs kids, but they did worse as a school because they had so many high needs kids. So um, I know that at a prior meeting, Ms. Fallon talked about some of the arbitrariness of trying to assign rankings to schools based on this. I think this, um, I think this kind of points that out. So that is the end of the MCAS presentation. I think I'll stop there and see if there are any questions about that. Questions from the committee? Ms. Fallon? I just have a sort of general question about, uh, <coughs> I know you're on the superintendent list serves, et cetera. How, how are other districts feeling about this sort of, I mean, to me it's like absolutely, I fail to see how this is an improvement. Like I have a ton of confidence in making any predictions or assessing needs based on this first round. Um, of information. So let me say that I feel blessed to work in Northampton because I think there is a community with a sophisticated enough knowledge of what the test can do and can't do that it doesn't um, overemphasize it. But many of my colleagues work in communities where if you know your percentile ranking goes down one point, it's a major crisis. Um, so I think there's a great deal of concern about the change to the new MCAS and the fact that everybody's rankings are dropping. Um, I don't, there's a concern that the public isn't gonna understand that. Um, there's, I'll say a pri this is not exactly the question that you asked, but um, yesterday we got information about the transition to MCAS 2.0 for high school. I think that is starting to stir up much more concern because the high school test is the high stakes one. And um, they ha have given us the projected failure rate. The projected fail rate is going to double. Um, and we don't know how John and Abigail Adams scholarships are going to be administered. They were based on a test that no longer exists. Um, so there's a lot of concern about that. Yes. Um, um, wow. So projected failure rates are going to double. Is the test much harder than it was in the past? Or is the standard for passing different? Yes, it's a more rigorous test. Did they just send out guidance, though, that that won't apply to the current line? So next year, so here's next year will be the transition year. So next year, every high school in the state will be identified to try out questions in either ELA or math. Uh, the school has to <coughs> provide at least 25% of its population to take the tryout questions. The tryout questions will be given in a third, fourth test, actually, it's a separate test setting. Um, one thing that we'll have to think about is whether we want to exceed the 25%. You know, there's, I think, two, two schools of thought on this. One is um, it's another test. It's more time away from instruction, and so just keep it to the 25% minimum. Another thought is why not see how your kids really do because the next batch of kids has to pass it in order to get their diplomas. Um, so that's a discussion I'm sure we'll be having. Um, I think I may have lost the trail of the original question. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, so when does it become a, a, a pl a applicable? So it's, it's the year after that. It's those kids who will have to pass the new I think that's right. Yeah. Yes? When, when you look at these comparisons and you see that the current seventh graders have been more up and down, how do you look at, I mean, you started um, by showing us sort of the 
high percentage and talking about how the differentiating up seems to be having this effect. And how, how does it make you feel about sort of curriculum overall? Do you see any um, patterns or do you? Well, you know, honestly, I'll just say that I'm a little bit ambivalent about this um, data regarding getting more students into the advanced category because we've had so many conversations in this room about, you know, the importance of not teaching to the test, the limitations of the test, and, you know, then we undertook this big initiative to try to get more kids not only to pass, but to pass at the highest possible level of the test. Um, so, you know, my, the other thing that makes me a little bit um, ambivalent about it is while we increase the percentage of kids in the highest category, we also increase the percentage of kids in the lowest category. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that has to be the case, but it was the case for us pretty much across the board. And so I think one of the things that this district, this committee, this community struggles with, not unlike other communities, is where do we really want to put the major focus? Is it on trying to get the top kids into the advanced category, or is it getting all kids across the passing line? Is it getting <coughs> bottom kids out of the, the lowest category? Um, that's a tough question, and I think that that's, that's the area where the committee really needs to give some guidance to me and give some guidance to, the, to our teachers, I would say. Mr. Meyer. Can I just ask for those pictures that you showed of the cohorts over four years, were those true cohorts or were, I mean, they were controlled for entry of students in sixth and seventh or was that just the aggregated data for each one of those grades over the four years? We didn't suppress the data. It is largely the same groups. We do have some kids who come in the JFK at seventh and eighth. Um, I don't think enough to, to make much of a difference. We don't try to go to the high school. You know, we don't pick that same trend up two years later because there's such churn uh, in ninth grade. Losing kids from eighth grade particularly to Smith Volk and then picking up kids from other schools who joined at ninth grade. I don't think the cohort is comparable in any way past that point. It's just one thing I've noticed in looking at our MCAS data over the years I've been on the committee is that we always seem to have this trend. I mean, our kids learn a miraculous amount in, from sixth to eighth grade, or it seems there's a misalignment in terms of where our curriculum is for MCAS three to five versus the MCAS that they're taking in middle school. Um, because, you know, it, it, it seems strange that, co you know, you just, you go back year after year, we are significantly below, and then the kids usually recover to at least the state average or above by eighth grade. So I, w I was always wondered about whether it's a mismatch or why, why that picture is consistently remarkable rather than having a cohort that just tracks across at the same level. I don't think I have an answer for that. I, the thing that I look at when I look at the, the cohorts through that same sort of cycle of grades is sixth grade. There's always a dip in sixth grade. Yeah. Um, I think I do have an answer for that. Um, I think that has a lot to do with the transition. I think moving up from an elementary school to JFK is tough for a lot of kids. I've seen that in other districts where from elementary to middle, kids kind of lose a year. So I think that might have something to do with the dip. The recovery, I, I think, just speaking about where we are in terms of curriculum development, middle school curriculum is farther along and high school curriculum is farther along than the elementaries are. Um, probably worse than math than anything else. Um, we just bought Math Investigations 3 because we knew we were teaching a model that was not aligned to the, the, the frameworks. So I think that we'll see that part pick up. Um, I, I don't think it always has to be that the elementary schools are, you know, really struggling in math. I think that will change. Um, and I do think that as we fill in the gaps with curriculum, at the elementary level, it may not be so much of a dramatic improvement in, in JFK, but more of a steady line. Um, what if the test in elementary school is just not developmentally appropriate for where kids are? Well, that is an argument. <laughs> there have been a lot of analyses on that. Um, 
I think you could say the same thing about a lot of the these questions that are asked in middle school too, especially on that eighth grade science test based on the results um, that it yielded. Um, I do think that can be an issue, and I, I, I'll just say this. I think there is, um, I think there's still a bit of an unanswered question within our district about how much we can expect of kindergartners and first graders. That was even part of the um, group we were at yesterday. You know, we talk about um, deficits that kids have based on norms that have been established, but some people feel that even those norms are asking are based on everyone else trying to push their kids to do too much. So um, I think that may be a part of it. Uh, so I'm just I'm curious, you know, I, I guess we see how, you know, the insanity of the MCAS and how so much of it doesn't really make sense. And I think you did a good, good job of sort of underscoring some important parts and gaps and all of that. And yet it's on the front page of the newspaper. And, you know, there's some value parents <coughs> to some degree look at it. We have this kind of dysfunctional relationship to the MCAS tests. And we're not really sure, I feel like, sometimes how we feel about it. But I always wonder about how does the MCAS or do you, do you look at how MCAS scores align with all the other testing that we do? We all say the MCAS is one day, it's one measure. You know, how does it align to our grades that our kids get in middle school and high school or, and you know, it, it, how does it, that all fit together? Like, how do we think we're doing? That's, do an, we think we're doing? that's an excellent question. That actually goes back to one of the questions that I think came out of public speak. Um, so the one place where I've really looked at that is with our BASS assessment, which is, um, our main elementary reading assessment, reading measure. Um, I can't say that I've done the research, but districts in Massachusetts have done the research looking at the old MCAS. I don't know what it'll say for the new MCAS. But one of the things they found was looking at the third and fourth grade test, in order to have a 50% chance of passing MCAS, you had to be above the grade level expectations based on our BAS. So if we're saying that kids are meeting their BAS benchmarks, this is nothing against the BAS or against the MCAS, just saying they're not aligned. If the kids are meeting the benchmarks we've said are appropriate in our reading program, it's a flip of the coin whether they have enough skill to pass the test. Which is why one of my goals <laughs> last year in my, my, my educator avowal was to, to work on the fourth grade at Bridge School. <coughs> and get 100% of the kids in fourth grade above where they should be. Mm -hmm. And you know what? The result was exactly what it was supposed to be. 50% of them had passed, so. I know, it feels like it'd be, or I think it'd be interesting at some point to kind of look at that, like how MCAS fits in with kind of all the other indicators. Like how do, how do we, Northampton, feel like we're doing? Not just how does the state and, you know, this kind of well, framework they've sort of put on us. Right. I think the reason people learn some things from, but other, you know, has a lot of shortcomings. Yeah. Right. I, I think the thing that's valuable about MCAS is the comparisons to your, your peers and comparisons to statewide average. You know, one of the things that I haven't said much, but um, except secretly into small groups and ministries, I guess to say publicly now, I've always thought that it would be great if I can make that chart look like all the green lines over 50%, because then you'd have all of your schools in the top half of the state, in the top state in the nation, that's not too bad, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, and I know that's just sort of the way, that's beyond bird's eye view, that's like satellite view, but I think that those kinds of pieces of information are helpful. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my other question was um, about the sort of differentiating up in the advanced groups that you highlighted in the beginning of your presentation. So I understand that we've moved more into that advanced category, but what happens for kids who are already in that advanced category? What I've never understood is there's kind of a ceiling involved. So what does it say about those kids who were already in the advanced category? How are we differentiating different? How, are, how do we know if we're differentiating up or if we're being successful um, in helping them actually live up to their potential as well? Well, in terms of MCAS, you can't really tell. Yeah. You can't go beyond advanced. You can look at growth to see if they're growing at the same level as all the rest of the advanced kids in the state. Um, mm -hmm. So we do have that kind of information. Our 
growth percentiles are pretty much the same as everyone else's growth percentiles. Um, so I think you would say that our, our advanced kids are probably growing as much as the advanced kids anywhere else. But that still leaves open the question, is that enough? You know, are the advanced kids everywhere bored? Who knows? Mm -hmm. And do we have any other indicators or assessments or evaluative tools that? Well, there's, there's AP testing. For whatever reason, I don't actually get this because AP is a test that, you know, is standardized test, just like MCAS, and uses a lot of the same t techniques as MCAS. They actually, the curriculum is deliberately teaching to the test, but for whatever reason, it's not seen as having the same problems as MCAS. Um, so there's that. We do look at MCAS performance. You know that, I'm sorry, AP performance. You know, every year Brian comes and he talks about the hundreds and hundreds of kids who get threes or better. So that's one um, indicator. There's SAT scores. Those are strong in Northampton. It's different than this because it's a self selected group. Not everyone takes SATs. Um, you know, there's the student feedback, which you know, in some cases has said students have felt bored, in other cases have said students have felt like the teacher's too hard, and sometimes say it's just right. I don't think, we have not done the analysis to see whether there's any kind of correlation between how kids perform on MCAS and how, what kind of feedback they give to their teachers. It's not really designed to do that. Yeah. But um, yeah, you know, and then one of the things I'm gonna say when I get to my report tonight is, a lot of what we were hearing at the MASS MASC conference was maybe this is the complete wrong stuff to be looking at anyways, right? You know, we may be getting really good at forcing kids through a system that isn't really so relevant for their futures. So, I mean, I, I guess the, the real measure for that, for the question you're asking are, you know, are the kids engaged? Are they able to do something? You know, um, we don't really have good measures of whether kids are able to do something. We only have measures of whether they're able to produce academic knowledge at this point. Right. And it sounds like we only have that information really for high school. If it, we're looking at APs and SATs, we're talking about juniors and seniors really, not elementary and middle as much. Right, well, all, all you have there is MCAS. I mean, you do have, you do have BAS and BAS shows things. I mean, BAS shows that we, in a typical classroom have a four grade span between the highest learner and the lowest learner. So we, we can't identify kids who are at, you know, above grade level and do do that. Um, but we can't, I don't think we have a good way of answering your question about whether they feel challenged enough if they're on the upper end of that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ms. Hennessy. The comment being, it just still feels that we could predict with zip codes similar yeah mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. so and to answer your question um, but they put forth to the committee I think we're charged with doing both bringing up the kids were struggling and differentiating up like and yet it's really about funding all the time that we, we feel like it's a false choice that we have to do both so that just stresses me out mm -hmm. knowing the funding that mm -hmm. we're looking at and I know a lot of people That's just a comment. Um, but my question is, do we have different opt-out numbers for the different elementary schools? Were, was there a significant difference or was it very similar? No, it was a low opt-out rate across the board. No, I wouldn't say. Mm -hmm. Other comments about MCAS? Questions? Okay, thank you, Doctor. You wanna transition to your next presentation? Yes. Um, I. At your seats, you have two handouts that were shared yesterday morning at Bridge Street School. I just want to walk you through them. The first is uh, total school committee instructional expenditures, what's known as the 2000 accounts. And it shows, if you look at the last two columns, an adjustment that we're making in that to address some concerns about equity. And also, it's a change in sort of our thinking about it. Um, just to explain that whole process. Um, in 2016, the column all the way on the right, we held, we held district-wide programs in the district account rather than charging them to individual schools. 
and the rationale behind that was those are programs that serve kids from all over the city the biggest one is preschool and we didn't want to include them in school-based numbers because it would artificially inflate the spending at the schools and then make it less likely for um, future administrators to be able to say those schools need more help however as we learned it had the counter effect of then making it appear that those schools are being underfunded um, this really sort of jumped out to me when I saw um, a one pager that some of the parents from Bridge Street were um, passing around they were there was two cells on there looking at low lowest funded schools and it was Bridge Street and Leeds I said, I think that's what it meant. They were both pink. And I said, how does that happen? <coughs> I know. It's because we're not counting the preschool costs in the cost center. But the state counts the students in the, the divisor, right? So it, what we did for the 2017 report was we put those, we reported those salaries to the actual schools where the, the teachers are working and reported this and the students are reported to the actual schools where they attend. So preschool, even if you're living in the Ryan Road district, if you attend Leeds, you show up in the Leeds number, and that's where the salary for your teacher is. So we made that adjustment. Um, the other thing that I'll just point out about this enrollment, um, this is looking at the enrollment of students who actually attend the schools. If you go on the Department of Ed website, you'll see the numbers are higher than these attendance numbers. That's because there are students who are not in district placements. There are students who are related services only. Um, Bridge Street is um, impacted more by that than anyone else sort of inflating the student number because being the downtown school, it's where a lot of families go to get related services. So that impacts therapy services and we put more therapists there in order to address that piece but it doesn't have an impact on class size or the other operations of the schools. So when you see the adjustment applied from 2016 to 2017, you can see the per pupil spending um, figures just in the 2000 accounts change quite a bit. Um, and so on a per pupil basis in the 2000 accounts only, the highest funded school right now is Bridge Street, lowest funded school is Northampton High. Um, that is just I just want to re reiterate that's just 2,000 accounts the overall number is around 13 or 14,000 per student so the utilities the transportation and everything else will also get um, a pro you know apportioned across schools and make these numbers look different in the end uh, but I, I think that's that's an important piece because I think our prior way of doing it um, in, an, in an attempt to not make the school seem like it was more flush with cash than it is, made it seem like it was concerningly deprived of cash. So making that adjustment, and that's the way we'll report the data moving forward. Um, second piece is this bar graph of showing first grade, in, it says incident reports, these are actually <coughs> nurses incident reports at Bridge Street School. It was really what we felt was sort of the only reliable indicator um, because there's been some uh, concern about information teachers have received about filing incident reports. So we're going to be retraining staff across the district so everyone is reporting the same things and not reporting things that shouldn't be reported. But we felt this was a fairly reliable um, set of data because we felt that if a nurse had to provide a medical intervention for a child, that was pretty much always going to be the same regardless of whatever reporting form a teacher filled. So um, this shows the incident, those types of incidents, Bridge Street only, shows them on a weekly basis. And a few things that I'll point out as sort of key markers here. December 25th, I'm sorry, September 25th is when we began intervening in the first grade at Bridge. You can see that we saw some declines immediately. You can see that October 9th, was a bad week. Um, we've spent a lot of time trying to remember back to October 9th about what was happening. Um, and our best you know, explanation is change in behavior and human development isn't a straight line path. 
like those charts. You know, it, it yo-yos up and down. And that was, that was a week where our interventions weren't working well. But then the pattern continued. The week of the 16th was the lowest. The week of the 23rd, there were no incidents. The week of the 30th, there were no incidents. This past week, I believe there was one incident. So you can see that that That's intervention um, started to have an effect, with the exception of the week of the 9th, pretty, pretty much right away. Um, the week of the 30th is important. That's the week that we added additional staff in the classrooms. Um, I'll also say what the change in the intervention was starting on the 25th. That's when um, we basically repurposed the mission of uh, Tate Behavioral. One thing that, let me just back up a second. One thing that we did in order to try to prepare and compensate for the difference in the makeup of Bridge Street School was provide them with 25 hours of BCA consultation. They're the only school in the district that has that amount. The rest of the schools share one BCBA. I'm not saying that it was enough, not being defensive or anything. I'm just saying um, what we did with that, beat that consultation, which we thought we were going to use for basically four kids who were receiving discrete trial training, was say, put it all into the first grade. Um, so on the 25th, that's when they started working with the, the group in the first grade. Um, and then when we made the change on, on the 30th of putting additional staff in the class, that's when we sent Tate to go back to its original mission, which was helping those kids who need discrete trial training. It's actually helping to supervise the staff who's providing discrete trial training for those kids and also assisting with kids who have behavioral needs in other classes at the school. So that's sort of where we are now with that. Um, looking, I'm just going to point this out. One thing that has been um, a lot of our discussions, both the administrative level and the teacher level and the parent level, is so what kind of changes could be made next year? This isn't a proposal. This is just an observation. Um, when you look at the comparable schools for the elementary, we didn't show you what the, the actual comparables were, but when you look at them, they're pretty much all schools in Cambridge, and so, and they pretty much are all doing better. And I've been looking at what are the differences in their staffing. Um, their, one of the big differences is most of them have BCBAs. Um, they actually have larger class sizes, not that I'm recommending that. Um, but they have pretty much every elementary school BCBA. So that may be one thing to think about moving forward. Um, another thing we did was uh, an audit of special education services across the district. We had Josh Dixon go with the building administrators, visit every single elementary classroom, and talk to the teachers about whether or not they felt they were implementing the IEP services in their, in their classrooms. And so what the sort of rough percentage I would put on it is 85 to 90 percent were being delivered um, exactly as written in the IEP. There were schools where there were no concerns at all. Um, there, and I would say that the, um, the remaining 15, 10 to 15 percent that we need to work on were really amenable to reorganization of schedule kind of interventions. So um, we've reorganized schedules specifically at Jackson Street and Bridge Street to address areas where teachers were having trouble being in the room enough minutes to fulfill service delivery grids. In fact, um, the third grade at Jackson Street has been rearranged sort of twice. Um, we're working on making adjustments to teacher schedules at Bridge Street School, and um, we'll be recommending some more, uh, in the slides coming up next, some more changes to provide some more support in both of those areas, which were really the two areas where we found some problems. Um, really, Bridge Street, specifically the first grade, um, and a little bit in fourth grade too, and Jackson Street in third grade, and maybe a little bit in first grade. Um, but we have, um, I think, I don't know, know what the results would have been like last year, right? It's always supposed to be 100% of IEP services provided. That's the requirement. Um, but we've never, never asked every teacher, are they actually doing it? Um, 
I think this was a good process. I think it's one of the things we, <coughs> I've learned from this. I think it's probably something we should do on an annual basis and probably do earlier so that if there are situations that can be addressed, we can um, get on them earlier. Uh, one of the things that also came out of this was the need to rethink scheduling practices. Um, because this goes back to the comment about what can we learn from places where things are working well and what can we learn from things where we're having struggles. One of the things Josh did in addition to just documenting where things were implemented and where there were still partial non-implementation was ask, so how did you get your services to the kids if you were getting them? Or how did you not get your services to the kids if you're not getting them? And one of the the uh, main differences he found is in schools where there's no concerns at this time, it's because they built their entire schedule around IEP grids. And in schools where they're, we're trying to reschedule them now, they sort of created a traditional elementary schedule and tried to fit kids with IEPs within that. So I think that, you know, this may be one of the big learnings of this and maybe a way we can sort of do this better next time. I think of this in terms of how you schedule a high school, which is not something I'm an expert at, but every high school principal I've ever known says you do band first because everything else has to fit around the band schedule. I kind of think that maybe as we schedule next year's elementary classes, we look at IEP grids first and then figure out times and everything else after that. Um, so that's been a, another part of the intervention and just sort of a status update. And uh, there is one other, uh, one other situation that we have in the district that I just want to report affecting a few kids. We have a vacancy for a physical therapist. We've posted it two times. We haven't been able to get uh, <coughs> someone to do it. We do have, we've been leaning on our part-timers to basically work full-time schedules to try to get kids their PT services, but we're a little bit short there. That'll be resolved when we fill the position. Um, at this point, we've decided we're not gonna fill it um, you know, with a regular employee, but we're looking to contract that service out because we think we'll have better luck there. So that's sort of the um, status of the, the uh, intervention and, and, and the look at inclusion across the district. And I think sort of the next time that we'll be able to have some data to report will be after the midwinter screenings. Because um, then we'll have an opportunity to see where the kids were at the end of kindergarten or, kindergarten or whatever grade they're in, where they've grown to the midpoint of the current year, and we'll be able to compare that data to prior years and, and make some inferences about where things are working well and where things are not working so well. But um, before we get to the midpoint of the year, I'd like to recommend readjusting and reallocating some district resources. As you recall, last year we set aside hundred thousand dollars for unemployment costs those um, unemployment costs um, really have not failed, have not materialized we don't think they will materialize because most of those were for ESPs who we thought we might have to lay off as it turned out we didn't have to lay off any ESPs um, so I think that money is safe to reallocate so um, Budgeted 100,000. At this point, we think we're going to spend about 20,000. So, um, here are some reallocations. For this chart, just up there to give you a sense of where staff is, I one of the things that one of the things that I've been saying is, it's really better in terms of trying to figure out equity to look at staffing rather than to look at dollars per pupil. Even though I just reported dollars per pupil, because the variance in staff salaries is so high. Um, you know, just to give you an example, in the Cambridge schools I was talking about that are comparable schools to Northampton, their, their per pupil cost is about twice as much, but the staffing is virtually identical because of the difference in the cost of staff. Um, so uh, this is just to explain some of the terminology in here. The current enrollment is excluding OOD students, those are out of district students, students who are placed out of district or students who are receiving related services only but not attending classes. Next column are the students eligible for free and reduced lunch, poverty index. Next, percentage of students who are ELLs. 
next percentage of students who have disabilities and then the last two columns are full-time equivalents for teachers and full-time equivalents for ESPs so that just gives you sort of an overview of where the staff is right now and what the needs of the populations are right now and then where I where I'd recommend putting some more support uh, of the 80,000 I'd recommend moving 33,000 <coughs> To Bridge Street for an interventionist that's one of the staff that we put in on the 30th that um, person is already there it's currently being paid from um, funds available at the building level but I think we should move this money to bridge so they can continue that and so that they don't have to have the rest of their budget crushed by adding that staff member um, we'd like to increase RTI staffing for both bridge and Jackson there's one teacher providing reading interventions who is currently working a three-day-a-week schedule. We want to increase her to four days a week, and we want um, her to split uh, split the day between Bridge and Jackson. Um, so she'll be working with Bridge Street students in the morning, Jackson Street students in the afternoon. It doesn't impact the number of Bridge Street students seen at all. What it does mean is that those kids will now get four days a week of intervention instead of three days a week of intervention. And it means that the kids in the afternoon at Jackson will be able to get, um, a whole new batch of kids will be able to get the intervention. We want to focus that specifically on third grade. Um, it is one of the things that we um, got from our stakeholders review on RTI last year that we're doing a really good job in kindergarten and first and second grade, but we're using up all of our staffing and there are still some kids in the third grade who could use an intervention. Um, also, you know, just sort of a sad commentary on some of the problems with our prior model. Some of the kids in the third grade at Jackson in a self-contained model, although having no evidence of a reading disability, have really extremely low reading skills because in self-contained classes you don't necessarily get that kind of support. Um, so that so that's why we want to um, target the um, RTI the additional piece that we give to Jackson to the third grade because there's like a bubble of kids who were in self-contained or in third grade now um, an additional ESP for Jackson also for the third grade um, Jackson Leeds and Ryan Road have requested resource monitors I know you're gonna say <coughs> asked to, you recommended cutting them from the budget because no one could find anyone to do the jobs um, but the principals have assured me they can I actually have an HRD 2 which are which is our personnel action form for someone at Jackson um, so that position can be filled as soon as the, the money is moved over I think Ryan Road and Leeds will have the same um, bridge the reason bridge is not up there is because bridge said that recess is actually not a place where they're having problems so they don't want to use they don't want that um, and then the last piece would be to provide additional academic support at NHS. This is specifically for students who were <coughs> in the ALP program, um, as you know, was restructured and then restructured again this past year. There's a problem in the schedule right now. It's basically fourth block. Problem in fourth block is all the teachers associated with the program have prep. So when kids need help, there's no one to help so this additional money would increase a part-time teacher at the high school so that he could work in that fourth period block this isn't enough to get through the end of the year but um, there's another student who will probably be moving back to the high school from an odd district placement so at that point we'll have some money that will save on that tuition which will want to be probably repurposing to increase that fourth block support for the rest of the year so um, that's how I believe this money could best be spent I think it addresses a number of the concerns looking at the audit it definitely hits the areas where we've identified places where we're thin in supporting inclusion and it also addresses a need at the high school so that's my proposal question discussion from uh, school committee Yes, Mr. Cobb. Oh, wait, yes. okay. <laughs> so, 
so a few uh, quick questions at the end. What's, what's the uh, desire for the recess monitors? Is that, um, what's, what's the, uh, why, why is that a need? Uh, right now, the principals and, it's really to give the principals some relief, which was the main reason why we had recess monitors to begin with. Yeah. Um, the principals have been doing recess duty, not, and they don't complain about it, but um, they, and I think they will still continue to do recess duty from time to time, but it makes it so that they're not committed to recess. recess. Okay. Um, so I, I'm assuming, and please correct me if I'm wrong, so I'm assuming there's been a lot of uh, conversations around this, and I'm, I'm curious, so when you look at this, you don't see JFK anywhere. You see a little bit of money for Ryan Road, for example, uh, and Leeds. So, how how much work involved with the schools, uh, particularly the school administrators, and you know, can you just speak a little bit about the evolution of the thinking behind this, and how much uh, collaboration and agreement there was between your your all team? So the, this um, this allocation was recommended by the all team. Um, basically, said we think we have eighty thousand dollars. How can we best spend it? That was sort of the first filter. Um, I have discussed the different allocations at the individual schools who would get them with the with the administrators who individually run the programs as well as the teachers who run the programs. Um, I have had an opportunity to have some discussions with NACE as um, recently um, and let basically said this is what I'm thinking about doing. If you can think of a better way, let me know. Mm -hmm. um, but I, and I think the there hasn't been a better proposal or an alternate proposal, so I think um, there's a feeling of comfort. <coughs> this, is, this is the amount that's available. This is probably a good way to spend it. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. If Sanity. you look, what you have looked, and we see this high needs population growing. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Um, so, I don't know if it is BCBA. Certainly that's one of the ideas that's on, on the table. One of the things that I've also thought in the elementary schools is we put in um, these tiered support people, um, I think it was three years ago or four years ago, really it was to address chapter 222, but what they've become is people to support behavior. Thinking. Another option may be to have two of those, so mm -hmm. one to support behavior and one to support academics. Mm -hmm. um, but there's there's a lot there's a lot of thoughts that I, um, I need to have before that becomes fully baked and ready to present. Uh, the big thing is I think that unwinding that that disproportionality we have yeah. at Bridge Street is huge because you know. Maybe in the beginning it wasn't so bad, but as the whole high needs population mm -hmm. grew, I think they were particularly impacted. So um, I think that's a piece. Another thing I've, I've been thinking about is, so what happens when students transition to sixth grade? Mm -hmm. You know, It may mean that the services at the middle school look different, which may free up resources for the elementaries. I'm not sure, mm -hmm. it might. Um, but I think that um, there are a lot of students who are experiencing success in the mainstream for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I don't think parents are gonna to wanna to say, okay, we'll put you back in programs just because you went to JFK. Um, so there will have to be some rejiggering there. I think that process will sort of be more orderly because I think it'll transition through the three years. Um, but I am looking at that and what that means is a potential way to maybe do some more restructuring in the next budget. Um, and then I do look at academic coaches too. You know, we started the process of adding an ELA coach this year. Um, we'd love to add a math coach next year. Um, in a way, it takes some of, I, I don't wanna say it takes some of the cognitive load off, but it provides teachers with some assistance in planning lessons, which I think is really important at the elementary level, where the teachers are all subjects all day long. Um, it is another difference when I look at sort of some of our competitive comparator schools that are doing a little bit better. I see more coaches. Um, 
So basically, I think in terms of trying to address the needs, um, I look at other schools that have similar populations and seem to be doing better. I would like to have our staffing more reflect what they're doing. Mr. Meyer. Um, in terms of the, um, all the discussion, was this seen as, was these funding allocations seen as the baseline for future budgets in terms of allocating resources, or, or to what extent were they seen as addressing immediate needs such as the bridge to first grade now? Um, should we look at this as something that will be in substantially the same form for next budget year? I suspect that it will. The one thing that I can't tell is, at this point, what there's two big question marks. So one is, every grade is going to move up. Some schools are going to be moving large grades up into the middle school and replacing them with smaller grades. That may free up some staff that can be reallocated. The other thing I'm looking at is our census numbers, and I'm not sure 10 kindergartens is going to be sufficient for next year. Um, if we need 11 kindergartens, <coughs> that's going to be more positions that will have to be funded some way. Um, but just looking at the numbers we have right now, we're about 50 above where we were. Those won't all show up, but if, if 18 or 20 of them do, that's another class. And then also thinking, where do we put the class? Uh, so there's a, lot, there's a lot that I think will be on the table as we go into this next budget. Um, but I, you know, I, I think we're providing what we think is the right level of resources for the kids we have. As those kids move, we need to make sure that the resources move with them. Yes. Um, so piggybacking on Danny's question, um, it's, it's sort of a two-parter, that um, we had been told a number of years ago that our census numbers were going down and that we were sort of having smaller populations, but it sounds like that's not exactly what we're seeing in Northampton now. And then um, I'm just curious with the building of the new apartment, um, the apartments on Pleasant Street, that we would be anticipating that that's in um, Bridge Street School District. And so I guess I have to sort of ask this really dreaded question, which mm -hmm. you can say I have no answer for, but does there come a point where we have to talk about redistricting our neighborhoods? Well, I'm glad you said that because that's not a word a superintendent can say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess the way I've always looked at it, and I'm not saying this is the right way, it's certainly not the evidence-based way, it's just sort of my practical judgment way, is that you need to look at redistricting when you have a space problem. Okay. I think it's potential that there could be a space problem coming up. Any other questions about the proposal? And I would, of course, need a motion to put the proposal on the table uh, in a second for, for an actual debate. We approve the to reallocation, okay. Second. Second, okay. So any, um, any other questions or discussion about it? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor of approving the reallocation, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that is approved. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Provost. Next, we have a, uh, a vote. Uh, I'll have Dr. Provost explain this. This is to hold a, a grievance uh, filed by a Jackson Street teacher in abeyance. Uh, oh, did I miss a report? I'm sorry. We won't take it personal. Okay, well, <laughs> why don't we do what I've already started it. Let's take, the, Actually, let's take the vote and then we'll go back to the report. I'm sorry. Um, so in, in my answer to Mr. Kaufman's question, I mentioned my opportunity to collaborate um, with NACE around some issues. So basically problem solving issues in third grade and issues in first grade at Jackson Street, issues regarding kindergarten supervision, I mean recess supervision, all of which um, are addressed by that um, vote that you just took, and also the rejiggering of schedules that I discussed in my process. Um, the feeling um, shared, I don't want to speak for anybody, but 
verbally, the feeling that's been communicated to me is that we're close to resolution, um, but it's not, NACE doesn't have the authority to unilaterally extend timelines so we can continue working on it. They need agreement from the committee to extend the timelines. So I would entertain a motion to, uh, to hold that grievance in abeyance. So moved. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. And now we will return to uh, item G and a report from uh, Ms. Pisansky and Ms. Fallon on the MASC MASS conference 2017. Uh, in Cape Cod, where, where the high performing MCAS districts are located. <laughs> so. Can you build us a beach? <laughs> well, Musanti Beach is quite nice. But, uh, <laughs> I don't know if we can charge $25 a car. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a little steep. <laughs> but. Um, so um, I guess this year was very different from last year, and last year was inspiring and reassuring. <coughs> and this year was just a lot of information, to be honest. Um, I attended a session on the early education update, uh, the globally inclusive schools with our own Dr. Provost presenting. Um, Sessions on School Law 101 and 102. Um, it was a review by those the, the legal counsel for the MASS and the MASC um, uh, on recent state and federal um, education legislation. We went to um, a session on state and economy by the executive director of Mass Budget and Policy, who's the only person who can make me completely understand all of those numbers for the moment that I'm in the room. Um, he's amazing. Um, and then a session on the opioid, opioid crisis and the coming of uh, marijuana, which tied in with the work that I'm doing with the Northampton Prevention Coalition. Um, so I guess the few things that I did want to share with you was one, listening to our discussion about the MCAS, um, Dr. Provost and Ms. Kosansky were with me when um, the keynote speaker on educating for the future, Bill Daggett, did a funny little exercise. He's a very dynamic speaker and he said, you know, during the MCAS test, are your students allowed to use a cell phone? And everybody said no and said, why not? They said, oh, you know, they might cheat and look up information. And he said, what else? And they said, they might text a friend for information, uh, for the answers. And he said, so they're being penalized for collaboration and using sources of information. And he was kind of like, is this really the most important, you know, metric you want to use, this MCAS testing? when those are skills that we do value and that we're saying that you can't use them. And so I really think that it kind of put it into perspective of the MCAS or you know, a handful of subjects on a given day at a given time and we're teaching so many other really valuable skills in schools and parents I hope remember that and appreciate it and I know that we need to, to think about the big picture um, about what do we really want our students to be able to do when they leave here. Um, the other, so then there's two more things since I've got the floor. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to say is I love going to these because networking with um, our colleagues from all over the state is really valuable in giving perspective. You know, you'll be a little bit irritated by someone from one area in the east that, <laughs> that'll be well done. gushing about their $125 million new state-of-the-art middle school. And like the more they go into detail, the more you'll we're getting our fourth new roof, you know. <laughs> um, and so, but then you hear, you know, the people from the bigger cities to our south having to constantly leave because they've got another 150 students from Puerto Rico registered that day. And there's questions about graduation requirements for seniors who have arrived who are the valedictorian in their high school and what does that mean? And so then you hear, you know, the young woman speaking so passionately about what is going on with the budget in Western Massachusetts that they are having to get donations of textbooks and computers and they are afraid that they cannot continue to operate and are going to have to look at utilization. So it really does give you... Did you say Weston? Western. Oh, okay. I was Isn't thinking. Yes. <laughs> I thought you said Weston, and I'm thinking that's yeah. not really possible. Massachusetts community yeah. they spoke very, up. Yes, yeah. they feel very much... Okay. No, I just... Yeah. Um, and so, so it does give you a perspective. It makes me really grateful to be in Northampton. I feel like we're in a really good place. Um, and I think that my biggest takeaway from the conference <coughs> happened to be at the very last sessions on the 
Friday afternoon and then Saturday morning on communication strategies. Um, it really hit home um, in this session, um, in particular about two-way communications with the, between the school committee and the community at large, and I don't feel like we offer that opportunity as much as we should. I know everyone does it individually when contacted, um, but I don't know that we're doing the kind of outreach we need to and making ourselves available for information exchanges and gaining the trust of the community and educating them on what we're doing and they're all so knowledgeable about their children and in their own respective fields that maybe it's a missed opportunity that we're not doing more um, you know, monthly meetings where three committee members you know, sit down and you show, if you show up, you show up and we talk about there's no agenda, but just to kind of put ourselves out in the community more um, so that we're not just reacting, we're, you know, we're actually being a little bit more proactive. So I'd love to talk about, about that at a future date. Um, and another committee member was talking about the real value of having a PTO liaison. They were talking about the PTOs are the ones who meet with the most members of the community, that you know, we should really make sure that they have the information that they need and that you know, they've got access and that we are a part of that. And so I would really like it if um, at a future meeting we discuss the possibility of having a PTO liaison. Um, and I think that was it. Um, the only other thing was since our last meeting, I did get elected vice chair of Division 5 for the MASC. So part of the responsibility for that is helping to plan a few meetings for the region, for the Connecticut River region. Uh, and so if you guys have ideas on professional development opportunities that you'd like us to bring out here or um, any other such things, as in the charter, we have to hold two meetings before the following year. So uh, that would be great. And that's my, my report. Uh, I think you covered a lot, which was <laughs> great. And uh, so I don't have to add much more, except um, I did attend the delegates assembly, which was um, in part consisted of the most um, intensive discussion of Robert's rules of order I have ever heard. It was so far and beyond anything I could even begin to comprehend, the level of detail and minutia, but um, all seven resolutions passed and it made me really realize that next year we should really bring the resolutions we should discuss it as a school committee so everybody knows and is able to give me input or whoever the delegate assembly is next year give that person input when they're um, on the floor and voting because you do have an opportunity to speak up amend amend an amendment and much much more so most of the resolutions were really about funding chapter 70 how to get more funding um, there was one interesting one about trying to push the date that we uh, our enrollment count is due to the state, which then determines our Chapter 70 funding and trying to push it from October 1st to into the winter. We kind of landed on the end of December, though. Some would like to see it further on since a lot of kids enter the school later in um, the year. And then um, they, everything passed. It got, it got amended to end of December and then it passed everything passed it wasn't that exciting <laughs> that was that one big amendment um, and then the last one uh, was really kind of su uh, well supporting the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid payments and um, uh, what was I going to say oh the uh, school vouchers sort of the federal movement and DeVos's movement on school vouchers and other ways of trying to take local control away from schools and trying to uh, fight a resolution to fight against that. So um, I also thought that Bill Daggett was a very um, uh, really compelling speaker, as Laura said, and his talk about sort of the coming of the fourth industrial revolution and how we are not testing or measuring what it is our kids need to really succeed was, um, he was, it was very compelling and sort of some of it was kind of frightening to be honest but um, hopefully everything he um, predicts for the future isn't going to come true but um, the other thread that I thought was interesting throughout the conference was there was a lot on uh, mental health and social emotional well-being and it's clearly uh, you know popping up for all communities all over the state and it was interesting to hear Wakefield talk about how they've actually developed this whole kind of quantitative I'm um, sorry qualitative metrics to actually measure social emotional 
growth and in a way almost saying like you know like sometimes we joke about the MCAS like if you measure it then it's real and so uh, but they're saying they were sort of putting up sort of social emotional growth as high up as the results of a MCAS test and that one way to make sure that the community and that we're all being sort of they were all being sort of held accountable that was to kind of try and put this measurement framework in place which I thought was a really interesting concept in all of that and you know we heard it throughout the opioid crisis um, talk that we heard that sort of whole level of sort of what's happening in our communities and you know how that's affecting obviously mental health issues and all of that so I thought that was just kind of um, you know, a little bit sad, but interesting that um, that's an issue that a lot of our communities are grappling with, just as we are. So, thank you both for attending and representing, and for these reports. Any questions about the reports? Well, I mean, I should add that the superintendent probably went to the most interesting workshop, which was on therapy dogs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they actually have therapy snails too. <laughs> Okay. Surprise me. Okay. <laughs> I can talk to you about that. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you. Can I just say, although sure. the session I facilitated was pretty good too, I thought. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was. It's you true. I only caught like one. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for those reports. Um, next, we have reports of our rules and policy subcommittee. Um, and I will turn it over to the chair, uh, Ms. Fallon, to go through the second readings on and votes on uh, two items. Thanks. Um, so the first policy, um, as the mayor said, um, my second reading will be voting. It is policy uh, BGF, advised for the school committee. Uh, it's updated to the open reading law, which is um, added in the legal references. Um, and the addition is to say that advisory committees created under this policy are subject to the provisions of the open meeting law and that the school committee will have the sole power to dissolve any of its advisory committees and will reserve the right to exercise this power at any time during the life of any committee. Okay. Would you like to make a motion? Uh, move to adopt policy BDF as amended. Second. Okay, there's been a motion made and seconded by Ms. Hennessy. Was that Ms. Hennessy? Okay, it was. Good. Um, and uh, any questions or discussion? Uh, yes. Yeah, I just had a quick one. Um, I brought this policy up to our newly formed student advisory committee because it pertains to advisory committees. And one of the big questions from our new student advisory committee was what would they have to do to get dissolved? They were a little concerned about being dissolved. Um, so if the rules and policy committee had any comments on what, what might. You know, um. Well, because that one's required by state law. Yeah, that's what I was wondering about it too, because it's like last, the last paragraph sort of addressed that. Like, yeah, because it, it's in state law. So then I was also, how would you dissolve it if it's then required? So. Sorry, was yeah. that, was that confusing? I'm sorry. I would, I would direct your attention to the highlighted sentence at the end of paragraph three. It says, advisory committees created under this policy are subject to the provisions of the mean law. I think that suggests that the advisory committees referenced throughout the policy are ones created by this policy. By this policy specifically. And the committee that you belong to is created by a different statute. Okay. Right. Thank you. And that's, I, that, that's the last paragraph points that out, that that was the last in accordance with state law, whereas these advisory committees are not. Okay. I'll re I'll, thank you for that clarification. I'll reassure my, my, my fellow, <laughs> my fellow students. Like <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded uh, to approve this revision. Any further questions? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Next. Uh, the second policy that we'll be voting on this evening is a second reading. It's filed BHE, uh, use of electronic messaging by school committee members. Uh, it's being revised partially to bring it into modern times, but also to reflect changes in the school reading law. It's added as a reference at the bottom. Um, we are adding in um, that. As elected officials, school committee members shall exercise caution with changing between the money shelves the electronic messaging service, including but not limited to electronic mail, text messages, social media, 
media postings, internet platforms, and the chat rooms. And then the last paragraph has been amended um, to read that um, under the public records law, electronic messages between public officials may be considered public records. Therefore, in order to ensure compliance, the district shall provide members of the school committee with district email addresses, which are archived. And I guess now uh, tweets will be archived as well <laughs> with the presentation we did. <coughs> So those are the recommendations we made. Would you make a motion, please? Well, all of a sudden, we didn't include tweets. Um, <laughs> so social media. media. So including so social media. Well, including, but not limited to. Right. I see you modernized it, though, but you left internet chat rooms. Are there still? <laughs> I know, I know. I asked about that. Apparently, they still exist. Okay. Well, any of us? <laughs> right. Right. So does LinkedIn. It definitely <laughs> came up in the conversation as to whether they were still in use. <laughs> um, so I move to adopt policy in the as amended. Second. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded. Any questions about this policy? I do. I have just one question. Okay. Does the city then have to give us Twitter accounts as school committee members? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't. I mean, do we? I mean, I. I do. I am. I do get con worried. Like, I do have a Twitter account. Mm -hmm. And I get like super nervous um, that I am going to do it wrong. <laughs> so I need clarification. But your Twitter account is is private, is right? Molly Burner, right? Famous and it author. It, that's right. And I <laughs> so, don't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's okay. Yeah, okay. that's fine. Yeah. So she got into an exchange with someone. Right. I think. What would that be? One of the Twitter accounts that would be registered with our IT department. I think you could easily, well, my, I mean, my I, I advice. I guess I'd bring it up because you have, the, the principal has a private, I mean, has a Twitter account that is connected to Northampton Public Schools. Yes, and that would be one of the ones that would be registered. Right, I don't, I don't think you can uh, archive them ex post facto, if you will. I think what has to happen is you make a determination about whether you're going to be using the Twitter account to um, communicate in your role as school committee member. Right. If so, then you have register it with archive social, and then you can use it that way. If you're not intending to use it that way, just as a private citizen, yeah. then you have to sort of make the determination that you're not going to get involved with to, policy right. tweets. Right. And just ask people to, to send you an email to your to your mm -hmm. NPS address okay. Okay. If, if they want to talk to you about something. Yeah. Okay. Is that okay? So you've made the motion. It's been seconded. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so those two policies are approved. Any other items on your report? No, we have a meeting next Thursday. Okay. So next we'll turn to the business administrator's report, Ms. Walzik, as well as the personnel report. First of all, you've got the monthly financial report. As I outlined in the cover letter, there's three deficit areas of the budget right now that we will continue to watch. Um, one of those, the instructional hardware, is actually in process of being corrected now with some budget transfers, and the other two we will continue to monitor. Any questions on the report? Next, you have the uh, three pages of the capital projects that were submitted to the city. They were actually due at the end of October, and we actually had our, our meeting last night with the Capital Committee to review these. You've got three pages. One are the Central Services Capital Request on behalf of NPS. You've got the IT Department Capital Request, which, which include three for the public schools that are in bold. And then you've got two additional ones that came in from my office, the superintendent's office, for anything that doesn't fit into Central Services or IT, which are basically some vehicle replacements. Many of these projects have been on there in the past. It's a five-year plan, um, and we just keep rolling things out as the funding becomes available through the city. So if there's particular questions, we can try to answer those. Did you have a question, Dr. Provost? I don't have a question, but I'd like to speak to one of them. Okay. On the IT request, the MPS 120 Chromebooks project, just to clarify, that would be to provide one-to-one -one devices at middle and high school. We did not feel that going below 
sixth grade was appropriate for a one to one. Um, but it would be a, a change if, it, if funded, would be a, a very important change for our district. I think, again, going to Bill Daggett, um, you know, the we saw a robot that lays bricks. We saw a robot that frames houses. Um, in the work world that we think we're trying to prepare kids for, um, if, a, if a process can be turned into an algorithm, the job is gone. And the work that kids will be doing will require um, computer skills. So we think that moving to one-to-one -one for the middle and high school may make, does make sense at this time. We feel that staff have had um, a number of years of NEF support and training to make use of it, instructional technology. And so if this is funded, that's a direction we're going in. Just wanted to make sure that didn't get overlooked. And no pressure on me, right, to fund it, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions about the report? Well, I'm kind of curious now about this one-to-one -one Chromebook. So we would literally be giving every student a Chromebook from sixth grade up? that they could also take home with them? Yeah, it's in two phases. So uh -huh. um, it wouldn't be 6 through 12 next year. It, this would be something for discussion with the school committee, but my initial thought is that it may be better to start at high school so that we don't have, so the seniors would at least have an opportunity to experience it for one year uh -huh. and then do middle school in the following year. Uh, How does that work? I, I, want, I want to be mindful that we're having a discussion but not getting too far afield. Right, I assume this will okay. come back to us another time to discuss. On the agenda yeah. that we start okay. launching into a... Yes? Um, so when, you, when you're talking about the other projects, they're, they're low, medium, high, critical priority. And when you're labeling other projects, it's zero, one, two. But there's no scale listed. I think it's just how each department did it. As I look at it now, all three departments did it differently. Right, and so, do these all automatically get funded? I haven't been on. So uh, it goes to a committee. A committee makes a recommendation. The committee basically is it's a it's a committee that I appoint to to play an advisory role and to go through this review process. They'll make recommendations just about priority about what what how to prioritize them, um, but then the finance director and I have to figure out what our debt capacity is, what our capital capacity is, and then try to figure out what we can fund. This is an exercise that the charter requires that you try to come up with a five-year program for all the various capital needs and you have to show how you can fund them. So we have, oftentimes we'll have, you know, what we can fit and then we'll have another group off to the side that these are still programs that departments want, we just don't think we can fund them. So. Um, so that'll be the uh, that'll be the exercise we have to do between now and March. Um, so, but basically, we ask every department to submit what what are your capital needs over the next five years. Um, it's not guaranteed; we we can't fund all of them, um, and so then we just try to find out what are the highest priorities, uh, and and what we can attempt to fund. that are prepared as a result of my final end-of-year financial report for the Department of Ed. That report is right up there on the number two behind the budget in terms of the priority for my office to get this in. It's various ways of looking at data. So those of you that like numbers and data, you've got probably enough to keep you busy right up to the budget here. Um, just to kind of point out the front one because I think it gives everybody a good view of the magnitude of what we are dealing with when we talk about not having enough money. Um, we, Never will have enough money, but we have $46 million that was spent on behalf of the public schools this last year. You see the actual expenditures out of the school committee budget of just over $28 million. You've got grants, circuit breaker, gift accounts, and then you've got the, the funding that comes from other city departments for things like snow plowing, health insurance for employees, um, and there's a list of what those are in there for you, the debt for the, the construction projects that have gone on, bringing it to a total of $46 million that was spent on the schools last year. There's plenty of data to keep you busy there. Um, next, you just have copies of the two warrants under your policy that have been signed since the last meeting. And then lastly on here, I guess I've been out of order, but 
Um, we've had one gift since the last school committee meeting under your policy where the principals can accept PTO gifts. The Ryan Road School accepted a gift of a garden cart with a value of approximately $125 from the PTO to put towards their garden project. Um, and this month there were no gifts accepted directly by the superintendent. And then moving on, um, the personnel report uh, being October is a little smaller than you've been seeing. We had seven hires over the course of the month, one separation, and then one retirement of a long term sub, Elba Colon, and a uh, long term ESP. Thank you very much. We'll now turn to the superintendent's report. Thank you. I'm happy to report that Northampton Public Schools has been awarded a grant from Advantage Math Recovery. I'll just refer to it as AVMR or Math Recovery from this point forward. It's the ad capital V Vantage, so that's how you get AVMR. The grant will fund training for a second math recovery champion. A champion is a teacher who is certified to train other staff in the math recovery intervention. We currently have one champion assigned to Ryan Road School. We plan to place the second champion at Bridge Street School. Additionally, this grant will fund training of four math interventionists who will be tasked with supporting special education students. Six additional teachers will be trained in the first component of math recovery. Twelve additional teachers will be trained in the second component of math recovery and six will receive the math recovery course on fractions. These are uh, trainings that are each from $500 to $5,000, um, and they'll all be fully covered by the grant. So this is a great step forward for elementary math instruction in our district. Um, staying on the topic of elementary schools, as you um, know, schedule problems, material delays, and construction mistakes have delayed the completion of the Leeds and Bridge Street roof projects. Nevertheless, we persevere. Probably no one perseveres as much as the fourth grade class that is now relocated at Bridge Street School and the teacher who was re relocated in the hallway in order to make room for that class. Um, however, um, that portion of the roof is completed and the um, room has been reconstructed. The uh, next week is the target date for moving that class back into its space and moving the other class back into its space. We're just pending the results of some environmental testing before we clear that for students to re-enter. Um, something that's been going much better at elementary schools is the repaving project at Leeds. Um, Work began this week on phase one of a three-phase project to repave the parking lot at Leeds and is expected to be completed next week. Um, those of you who follow my soon-to-be archived Twitter feed know <laughs> that the JFK Global STEM students and their teacher Kate Parrott showcased our Global STEM program at the 2017 Mass Q conference held in Fox Pro Stadium. They met Pat Patriot and saw the sights. Um, MassQ has become the premier New England educational technology conference. Um, so this was a real, um, real opportunity for our students to shine and a real opportunity for them to represent Northampton and the things we're trying to do here. Uh, at that same conference, our digital literacy and computer science coordinator, Molly McLaughlin, and our technology integration specialist, Rocky marini Prawl presented on Northampton's use of Google Read and Write to assist struggling students. Um, if, if we haven't discussed it before, Google Read and Write is an extension that we've deployed across the district and all of our devices. And it's, I believe, one of our first real moves into the realm of universal design for learning. For a total cost of $4,000, we're able to provide text-to-speech functionality for all of our students. This can um, be used as accommodation for a student whose listening comprehension is higher than their reading comprehension. It can also assist in the writing process as students hear the computers read back to them what they've just written. The, they can also use the extension to look up meanings of words or access a picture dictionary if their reading is such that they can't read the definitions of the words. Um, they can also use the extension to remove and simplify websites there Accessing. So some students um, have trouble with visually overstimulating material, which most of the internet is designed to be. So they can use Google Read and Write to take away all that stuff and just be left with text. Um, so um, this is, I think, a, a real good um, service that we're providing for our students. And the, the session was well attended. So other districts are interested in also um, coming on board. And also, the, the price point is so attractive. You know. I remember a time when you were talking 
thousands of dollars just to provide text to speech for a single student. Now we need a whole district for a similar cost. As you've already heard, um, technology and its impact on education and the economy was a major theme of the MASS, uh, MASC joint conference. Um, I'll, I guess I'll just discuss one part that hasn't come up so far, which is the warning and the concern that um, was buzzing through the conference. As Massachusetts is getting ready to launch its first in the nation campaign, based on our, you know, ability to be the first in every test basically known to man, um, what if we're entering a phase in our development where what you know really doesn't matter? And where we don't pay people for their academic knowledge, as we currently do, but instead pay them for what they can actually accomplish and their ability to execute. Um, if that's the case, then it might be really important for us to start become much more serious about non-academic skills, such as collaboration, negotiation, cognitive flexibility, perseverance, and compassion. Um, I do think this is likely to become a bigger theme as we move forward. Um, so many professions that were really knowledge-rich professions that were very well compensated are being automated out. Um, and it really raises concerns about, you know, whether all the stuff that I presented in the beginning of the meeting about how much we've done to move kids into the advanced category on MCAS is actually what's going to be helpful for them when they leave our schools. So that's a question I leave you with, and that's my report. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, so we have no bu new business tonight. Uh, we have future business and meeting dates. Uh, the super uh, superintendent evaluation team, November 15, 2017, 3 p.m. in the superintendent's office. Rules and policy subcommittee, November 16, 3.30 p.m. in the superintendent's office. Budget and property subcommittee, December 7, 3 p.m. in the superintendent's office. School committee meeting with student advisory committee, uh, December 14. That will begin at 6.45 p.m. here in the JFK community room. And then the school committee's regular meeting on December 14th, 2017 at 7.15 p.m. Next, we have a request for an executive session, uh, and I would ask uh, someone to make that motion. So I will move that we enter an executive session under Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, uh, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with Northampton Association of School Employees and Chapter 30A, Section 21A2 to hold a grievance hearing, whereas an open session would have a detrimental effect on the school committee's negotiating position and their ability to okay. deal with the grievance. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, that requires a roll call vote, please. Yes. 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 Okay. So I have to announce to the public that we are now going to move into an executive session. Uh, because these items uh, we we're discussing in an open session would be detrimental to the school committee's uh, positions. And I also need to advise the public that we will adjourn directly from executive session. We will not return to open session. Okay. So with that, we will now move into executive session.